two, one, we are recording. Jim is back with us. Mm-hmm. Uh, and yeah. also Amos is here as well. Jim, how are you doing, sir? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. I just noticed I didn't bring my earbuds though. Is that like, I'm hearing you fine. Is it fine with you guys? Yeah, yeah there's no echo. Good, good. Pretty good. Right. Yeah, I, really I am nice great. Stuff. I'm doing very well, man. How have you, how have you been handling COVID? Uh, well, I handled it by getting it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so I had it. My whole family had it um, uh, and worked through it. Um, so, you know, uh, we're, we're, we're in that kind of like liberated immune stage now, right? right. How'd you guys, uh, how'd you guys get in? Who knows? It was all over our town. Um, my, my kid's high school got shut down for two weeks cause there, there were a lot of cases there. Um, but you know, who knows, you know, um, my wife, my, my kids had had cold symptoms for about a week. Right. But nothing big. And then my wife got a cold and lost her sense of smell. I'm like, okay. And, and, and uh, we're like, okay, we got to get that tested. And then and she got tested and she had it. Yeah. So, and then probably, I don't know, maybe a week later is when I got sick. And, and so I was the last one to come. I, I thought I was all stud, like, oh, I'm not going to get it. I'm immune, you know? And, and so I was the last one in the house to get it. Yeah. Or at least to have symptoms. Yeah. Jeez. What was yeah. that like? What's your, um, okay. I'll say this now. So one thing, one thing to note is like, I mean, um, you would, you would have a hard time finding, right. If I may, like, like a fitter, more, you know, physically robust 47 year old guy. Right. Okay. This is a fact. Yeah. Right. And it, 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 I was never like so sick. I couldn't get out of bed. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, I've had worse flu without a doubt. Okay. Um, I never had a cough. I never had any respiratory symptoms whatsoever. Okay. I had like pretty weird muscle aches for about three days and a little minor fever. Um, And then it was just like a sinus infection thing. Okay. And after about five days, I thought I was through it. And I started working out again a little bit. And then I like rolled really hard with one of my sons yeah. and just crashed. Like just, just like, I was a mess. Right. Um, and I was like, okay, I have to respect this. It was, it was, it was day 16 after I got symptoms that I was like, okay, I'm good to go hundred percent back. to mm. full So it, it didn't really wipe me out at any point, but it slowed me down for two weeks, which is interesting because normally for me getting sick is like a 12 to 24 hour thing. And that's it. Right. Mm. Yeah. And so it, it did slow me down for 16 days. Right. Um, but it was, I was never like, I couldn't go to bed. I was never. Yeah. Did you, uh, did you, did you, did you take any sort of meds? Mm-mm. No, did you, I never did... lost my smell, but I had like weird things like where I would smell something and I would continue to smell it for like three days. <laughs> hmm. Yeah. 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 This COVID thing is a- Amos, a- Amos at one point thought he had COVID. Well, no, I, I was going to see my grandma and like I had, you know, sore throat, like, you know, maybe like a yeah. minor, minor fever. And so I figured I should go and get tested. Yeah. And like, I was like five hours waiting in the line. And like, while we were waiting, an anti-COVID, like anti-mask, like parade went by. Like this yeah. is in like downtown Toronto, like Young yeah. Street, the main street. Oh, so, you know, just around the corner and like, you know, there's speakers blaring saying like, what kind of pandemic happens where you need to get tested in order to know you have it? Uh, <laughs> so stuff like that. And so did, did you like leave then? No, no. I, I, I need, wanted to get the test just, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Grandma, she's, she's pretty old. And so yeah, you know, totally, to make yeah. sure that she'd be okay. I mean, I'll tell you what, when, when I had it, okay. I got really depressed. I mean like deep mm-hmm. depression, right? Really? Um, yeah. Yeah. Like real bad, like dark. It was like a dark two weeks for me. Yeah. And I don't know. I mean, I've heard people say that there, you know, there are maybe some psychological, I mean, it, 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 it gets in the neurology. Right. Um, so I don't know if that was, it. it's also like, that is the longest I've gone in my adult life without working out. Right. Mm. Okay. So, you know, my normal daily dose of endorphins, right. Was not coming in. Right. And, uh, no teaching, no jujitsu, you know, my family was there, but, you know, pretty much locked down in the house, right? We, Cause when we, when we knew we had it, we, we got to, you know, we want to be responsible people. So we were like, yeah, we're, we're going to be good, good kids. And we're going to walk in, right. You know, you know, until we're through this. Right. Uh, and, you know, um, and so, man, I, I, I got like the worst of it for me was psychological. It was not physical stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So could you, were you not working out because 
so after that role with your yeah. with your with your son after that role were you just too tired to roll or was it to, would, like a workout i was kind of like maybe i shouldn't screw with this hmm. right were you you know what i mean yeah did you so what, what, um when you were when you were, when you're depressed what, what 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 like what was going through your mind you know yeah so you know is it okay so i i would say that okay so okay here we go right okay it's on now right uh i think that two weeks of depression was like one of the best things that were happening hmm. right because i i was stuck in a situation where i couldn't cover up what was going on psychologically with a blast of endorphins and testosterone from like rolling or, or, or training. Right. You, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, I was, I was forced out of all the social contexts outside of my wife and kids and things like that. So it, it, it made me sit for two weeks and really look at some stuff. Right. And really, you know, kind of get to the bottom of stuff. And I think I made some pretty serious, like psychological, spiritual progress. Right. Hmm. Okay. And I think, I think there was a lot of stuff kind of, if you don't mind, I'll indulge this. Right. But of course, um, I think there was a lot of stuff that uh, like my dad died two years ago and, and uh, that I had never really gotten to the bottom of about my dad's death. Right. Mm. Okay. Now, I mean, as you know, I'm really into mortality. It's not that right. Um, and then I think my, my oldest son, who's named for him leaving the summer, right. That really kind of pushed that issue big time. And I think it all came to head in that depression uh, while well, I had COVID and I got, and like I said, I got to the bottom of it. I made some admissions about myself and stuff like that, that are important. Right. Um, and so I, I see that depression as like something that was good for me. Right. Mm. I'm not recommending like people go out there and get COVID so they can get depressed and like, okay. Right. You know, yeah. but I mean, we've talked about this before. Um, you know, I, I'm very into this notion that like moods reveal. Right. Okay. Um, like for example, like, so right now, um, it's Halloween when we're taping this. Right. And, you know, we're in a Halloween mood, right. And we're all going to go out and it's going to be scary tonight and stuff like that. And you're going to notice all this stuff, like the rustle of the leaves and, you know, the, all these things about your environment that you wouldn't notice if it weren't Halloween and you weren't in this kind of like scared mood. Right. Okay. And those things are really there, but you wouldn't have noticed them if it wasn't for, that mood, right? You, mm -hmm. see, you see my point, right? And so I think a, a depression can be the same way, right? It can actually reveal some things you wouldn't have noticed about yourself. You wouldn't have noticed about the world, right? And make you make you look at them, okay? And I'm not saying if you get depressed and, and it's chronic, you shouldn't get treated or something like that, right? But in my case, that that kind of, that that depression, I think, revealed things and made me look at them and, and work on, right? Hmm. Yeah. Would you... When you said you admitted it, are you still talking about, you know, were you, were you writing these things down or were you sitting and reflecting? Yeah. Know? A lot of reflecting and eventually talking to my wife about it. Yeah. 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 And I, I think for me, there was just, there was this kind of uh, like leftover um, like idealization of my dad. Right. You know, mm -hmm. where I kind of like identified my personality with his. Right. And sort of had a lot of my esteem for myself wrapped up with things he did that I didn't do. Right. And then when he died, I never really like let that go, right? Mm. So I probably should let go like 30 years ago, right? Um, and then fact, I think finally now, you know, I did that, right? After really looking at that, I had been like doing that kind of like projective idealization for so many years, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and then I think in letting that go, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling so comfortable like living in the soil I'm planted in, right? You know, uh, and so yeah, so so for me that was like major progress, yeah, and it happened while I had COVID, yeah, right. And I mean, on top of that, you with the COVID. I mean, if COVID, if anything, COVID's revealed is that, I mean, Jim, Jim, you and I have talked about this before. Um, it's just how people haven't really faced their own mortality. Yeah, you know, yeah, you yeah. Know, and yeah. people are freaking. People are very fearful. And I mean, understandably so to an extent, right? Yeah. You're fearful, but you can't live your life in fear the whole. I mean, it's it's just it, I think it's one thing, it's one thing to be careful, you're right in the way you're interacting with people. It's a but it's a totally different thing where you have anxiety that you might have COVID if you have a small sniffle, or you might yeah. have COVID because you accidentally uh, touch that elevator door without your glove, and so yeah. you're like anxious, yeah. and so you get you go get tested. Yeah. Especially uh, if you're in a group of people who are very unlikely to be seriously harmed by this. Hmm. 
right? Mm. One thing if you're an 80 year old diabetic, it's another thing if you're, you know, a 30 year old athlete, right? Right. What's the, um, what was the, what, what would be like one, what, what would be like one revelation in, in that two weeks where you were completely, you know, uh, not completely, but you were in, incapacitated to, to, to a certain extent and mentally and physically, like what, what's one revelation to you if you had a revelation? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think in, in, in a lot of ways, it, it kind of, um, re, you know, like renewed to me in ways that I had, I think I had failed, right? Mm. Uh, my commitment to my teaching, my commitment to my mm. colleagues, right? Uh, in ways um, that I had lost, right? And I think uh, being separated from it and making admissions about like who and what I really am, right? That I had to make right then and how much I was dependent on those things in ways I didn't want to believe I was, right? That that for me was like one of the really big um, psychological pieces of progress. And I've come out of that like really energized. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. Is uh, Go for it, Amos. Yeah, yeah I'm curious, like, do you, do you think that that's sort of a, um, you know, taking a step back, engaging in contemplation and coming to realization about yeah. like, um, you know, who you are and what you're living your life for, is that something that's going on on a large scale in like in the States right now? Because I've talked to yeah. some of my friends and they, they chalked up a lot of the social unrest over the summer mm-hmm. to like COVID lockdowns and people just not wanting to go back to the way things were. And then being able to take a step back and reflect on things yeah. uh, had sort of like catalyzed a lot of what happened. I don't know. I hope that's what happened. <laughs> I hope that's what it was. Right. Okay. Uh, I think there's also just, you know, when you, when you lock people up, there's going to be pent up energy. Right. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, I, I would like to believe that. Right. You know what I mean? But I have no like way of sociologically like verifying that. Right. Mm, right. You, you know what I mean? Um, yeah, so I don't know that, that I like that interpretation, right? I hope that's what it played out. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, I, although I'll say I'm skeptical that suddenly Americans have become massively reflective, right? You know, we we, we thought we've (laughs) seen that before, like after nine one one and all that, and that lasts about 10 minutes. Right. You know, know, um, you know, initially too, I, I, when when the initial COVID lockdowns happened, you know, in, in America, the big phrase was 15 days to, to, to flatten the curve and all that, right? Mm-hmm. And all that. Let's see what, what's happening there. But, <laughs> right. Um, uh, in some ways, I was kind of, I've kind of excited about that because, like, oh, this is kind of a sense of national purpose, right? And we're all going to like take a hit for the common good and stuff like that. Okay. Yeah. That's not how it's played out, though. Right. <laughs> right? No, you know, not at all. It's, it, it's just played into our polarization and our, our willingness to like manipulate you know, all truths for the sake of like, whatever our political goals are on both sides of the spectrum and all this. Right. You know, so Mm -hmm. I'm not optimistic that that's like, that there's something really uh, psychologically existentially healthy going on on a, on a grand cultural scale. Right. Okay. Um, But I will say in my case, like being laid low uh, and in the mood that caused me Mm -hmm. that, that revealed things to me that I needed to see. Right. Mm. Maybe just maybe that's my prayer that that's what's going on with, with more people. Right. Okay. Um, but I'm, I'm a, I'm a bit of a pessimist about all that. Right. Yeah. Okay. Fair yeah. enough. Yeah. Did you, you know, when you were sick, were you, <clears throat> were you reflecting, did you reflect on your mortality when you were sick? Did you ever think at one point, Oh man, I might die. No, I was never that sick. I was never that sick, right? It's just now when I did try to make my comeback too soon and it wiped me out, not, I mean, wiped out's too much. It was like, you know, I, I regret, like I took a step back and that's not something, usually when I'm sick, I can just like kind of work my way through it, yeah. right? Okay. So it wasn't really a mortality thing for me. It was just sort of, oh, whoa, okay. This is, this is a pretty serious bug and I'm going to have to be a good boy for a week here, right? Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Uh, for me though, it was just, it was, what was psychological, I was just being separated from like pretty much all the activities that I realized like give my life meaning, right? Mm. Except for like, you know, my, my wife and kids, right? But um, it, it, in being, in seeing these other things taken from me, it revealed the value of them to me. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Man, yeah. okay. So that, <clears throat> that's something that I've been thinking about as well, you know, it, in terms of, so this is somewhat more controversial, I'm about to say so. I, 
you know, both of you can disagree. Oh, okay, here's a funny. So Amos and I, right Amos and I found out uh, like a month ago, right, Amos, that we were featured on the Toronto Star. Oh yeah, yeah. About a month ago, the Toronto Star, Jim, is for context the most liberal, one of the most liberal. As would it be the most liberal, Amos? Um, it's it's up there. It's up there. It's a super progressive newspaper. You know, like the New York Times of Canada or something like that. Is it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So we didn't know this at all. So Kazingram Dialogue, our podcast, was featured in like upcoming Toronto, uh, upcoming Canadian podcast. And so we That's found out. Like, yeah. I was like, oh, this yeah. is. And then obviously they're like, yeah, this is, they've got some good guy. Uh, you know, they've got, they've got very conservative guests, which is not entirely true. Right. We um, have some... It's not. Right? Yeah. <laughs> There's some. Right? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Some. And then one of the criticism that was provided uh, was that um, we have to do le- less. We have to be less deferential. Right. Um, especially when you when you're having guests, uh, they were saying that we tend to say, oh, we agree with them more often than not. And, you know, anyways, I, I, I had thought about that. I was thinking about this uh, for a while. Um, uh, so this one, this is something. So th- this is something that I've been thinking about in terms of like uh, life in general you know, uh, is for a long time, I would have said, you know, if someone asked me, hey, what is the meaning of life, right? Or what's the purpose of life? I know some of the guys that we've had on, um, who's that, uh, who's our, um, Amos, who's, a, who's the philosopher that came on, uh, wrote the book, uh, Peace of Mind? Oh, Joshua Hokeshu. Joshua Hokeshu. Oh, sure, sure. Yeah. yeah, yeah, Josh, Josh, Josh said that there's a difference between purpose and meaning and all that stuff, whether I agree with him or not. Yeah. I probably right now I probably don't agree with him, uh, but because one thing I've th- been thinking is okay, if someone had asked me what is the meaning of life, IJ, you know, five years ago, I would have said uh, uh, the classic uh, re- reform statement to glorify God and enjoy Him. Right, that's the classic yeah. reform one. Yeah. yeah, I would have said that, but you know, after uh, you know, after Kazingram, our son died, you know, I really started reflecting on our mortality what it means to live what it means yeah. what does it mean to be human in this world yeah where you're gonna die if you whether you have kids my wife is maybe my wife will die you know years ahead of me yeah. or maybe i'll die before her maybe amos will die tomorrow um my friend who who's probably a, a year a few years younger than me you know he's in india and i got a text from our mutual friend he's like hey just so you know you know so and so died and i was like what you know, I was like, that. I was like, he's 26. Yeah. yeah. And so something that in terms of the life, it's, it seems to me that one's purpose in life is not necessarily, uh, people can say God, you know, people can, it, it's such a trivial, it's very trite to say, oh, it's God. God is, God is the meaning of life, you know, yeah. but that, that to me doesn't seem to be sufficient. It seems like, so if you take anyone, like if you take uh, Mother Teresa, you know, she would have said God is what gives her purpose. But really, if you look down at what she does, it's that she was, in her mind, she was trying to spread the love of Jesus, right? Yeah. She was doing that action, action-oriented life, yeah. right? You, you take yeah. Nelson Mandela, action-oriented life. So something I've been thinking about is, it seems that one's meaning in life is not necessarily what they say, right? It's not that God yeah. gives me the meaning of it. It's the, it's the action behind whatever you say. So you could find meaning. Cause I know I have friends, you know, who are atheists and they'll say, Oh yeah, of course I have meaning of life. You know, it's what I do. It's my family that provides meaning. And I would have disagreed with them about five years ago. I'd be like, that's total. That's, I'm not going to say <laughs> I was going to, I was going to, that's, that's solo BS. I would have said, Yeah. but the more I reflect, it seems that you could be a theist, a hardcore theist, a Christian, a Muslim, or a, a, a Jew, but you could still be completely unfulfilled in the way you're living your life. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah I agree. I agree. And I, and I think you could be a fulfilled atheist. I mean, many have lived, right? You know what I mean? Okay, so, okay, th- this will be controversial, right? Now, actually, I'm interested in hearing what Amos has to say about this. Okay, so, um, I, I have, I have a, I have a view such that I I think um, most metaphysical statements are vacuous. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying they're false. I'm not saying they're meaningless, but I say they're more or less vacuous. Okay. Or trivial. Right. Um, So for instance, okay. So I'm, I'm, I'm a Roman Catholic. Right. And um, 
you know, we have the, the doctrine of transubstantiation for, for the Eucharist, right? And the idea is that, you know, um, in the consecration of the Eucharist, uh, what happens is you have a change in the substance, but the accidents remain the same, okay? But if you think of it, like what that really means in uh, scholastic metaphysics is that, well, it looks the same, but, but essentially it's different. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. But that's not an explanation, right? I mean, like, that's the problem, right? Is how can this thing be essentially the same, but essentially different, but totally look the same, right? Okay, and so I see something like the doctrine of transubstantiation is it's really just a name for a problem. Okay. Uh, it's a, it's a way of like, like, like tagging a problem. Okay. Um, and so what does it, what does it mean to sort of adhere to the doctrine of transubstantiation? Like, what would it mean to really believe that? Okay. Mm. Cause I, I don't think if I, when I make the utterance, uh, I think that the Eucharist is a transubstantiation. It's not clear to me what I'm saying there. I'm not giving an explanation because as an explanation, I think it's completely empty. Okay. Um, what am I doing, right? Okay, what I think what I'm doing there is I'm committing myself to a practice, okay? Like, I don't, I don't think there's a content to transubstantiation, right? But the fact that I show up every Sunday, mm -hmm. right? Uh, I fast for an hour before I show up, right? I show reverence in the mass and I take the Eucharist, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's the practice, right? And it, it's this whole way of life centered around it that gives it meaning, right? That's what gives it meaning. It's, a, mm. it, it, it's the fact that, so I think in these very important beliefs, when we get to the exact edge of what language can say, uh, I, I then start to look at like what gives that meaning, right? What gives it a grip on me is what I do, right? What I do as adhering to it, right? Um, and so like, like take Mother Teresa, okay, she'll, she'll say, um, I, I think God's the point of my life, right? Okay, well, what actually makes that mean something, right? What actually makes that more than just a vacuous, trivial metaphysical claim is she goes out and she, she touches lepers, right? I mean, and, and heal, you know, and deals with them, and helps them and cares for them, right? That gave the claim, I think God is the point of my life, actual, tangible, human meaning, that can actually be something that we can live, right? Um, Elizabeth Anscombe had this, uh, I think it was actually a popular, it was written in a popular Catholic newspaper where someone had asked her, you know, so how do you explain the Eucharist to your kids? And she's like, well, I don't, that's just stupid. There's nothing really to say about it. It's a mystery, right? And she said, what I do is I take them to mass and I make them be quiet during the, you know, and, and I make them show reverence and that's it. That like, like to adhere to it is to take up the practice. Right. Mm. And so I think going to what you're saying there is like, what gives your life meaning, right? Isn't just doctrinal allegiance. In fact, I think merely doctrinal allegiance ends up being when you get to these really heavy metaphysical claims, right? Ends up becoming pretty empty. Okay. What gives it meaning is the way of life, the practices that, that follow on that allegiance, right? And, you know, what is it to, what is it to have allegiance say to the doctrine of the Eucharist, right? It's not this like special kind of mental act where I make myself believe something I have no evidence for or something like that. It's, I show up Sunday, I fast for an hour before I take the Eucharist, I bring my kids, I have my kids baptized, I have my kids at first communion. That's what it is to believe it and have allegiance to it. Right? Mm -hmm. And it gives well, my life meaning. Yeah. yeah, like ha having allegiance to it, like orders your behaviors in certain ways, but yeah. doesn't it also like um, order your linguistic practices, your yeah. imagination, um, and like- I say things now I wouldn't have said. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. yeah, I agree, I agree. Because yeah, I think there's like a, a, a sort of symbolic universe that comes with it. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I agree. Yeah, there, there's a, I mean, and, and I want to say like very careful, but there's a mythology that comes with it, right? Yeah. Okay, right, and, and myth isn't bad. I'm not saying myths are false. Mm -hmm. no, that, yeah. right? but, when I, but for me, what it is to adhere to say that doctrine or, you know, whether it's Eucharist or, you know, um, you know, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father, what have you. So I don't claim to know what any of that stuff means independently of my practice as a Catholic. Mm. Mm. Right. Yeah. And I think that's kind of the point you're making, IJ, right? Right. 
um, is what actually has meaning for humans is involvement in a world, involvement in a practice, involvement with other people, right? A, a, a tangible doing. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I think you're right. There's a, um, I don't know if I'm paraphrasing, paraphrasing or not in the seem to lag, but um, at least the phrasing in my head is uh, uh, people who talk should do and only people who do should talk. You know, there's, yeah. there's, and this is why Jim, uh, I, the, the previous podcast that we had, there was a, a Suan who was on, he's a, he's a Catholic guy. And yeah, I was telling I've, him, I've been on his show. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I was telling him, I was like, Jim is probably one of my favorite philosophers in that's alive because I know having talked to Jim, being Jim's friend, that what Jim says, Jim does. And as a philosopher, I think that's even more powerful in that. There, there are lots of philosophers that I know, professionals, non-professionals, who do a lot of talking, but no, there's, there's no doing, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. There are philosophers who teach ethics, but their life is just total garbage. And so for me, it was just sort of disillusionment where I was in the same boat before. Like when I was doing philosophy, you know, there, it wouldn't be false for me to say I was, I, I, I was prideful. And, you know, I still have pride. But in the sense that I would be like, oh, I know philosophy. Oh, what you're doing is question begging. Hey, what you're doing, blah, blah, blah. All that, all that right. BS stuff. It's not necessarily BS, but it's a, it, can be a lot, it can be a facade, right? That, that you want to portray yourself as smart, that you know your stuff. But at the end of the day, let's say you, know, you believe in God, but then your actions aren't oriented towards, let's say, honoring God. or, you know, And that, that can go on in different ways. But there's that sense for me where there's that switch. You're like, oh, yeah, I mean... There's a lot of talking that I've done, you know, but doesn't mean that I've I've done a lot of action oriented things towards that. And so there seems to be something something more powerful in and and you know, you were saying there are a lot of <laughs> there are a lot of atheists who've lived a very fulfilled life. Yeah. Right? And if yeah. you ask them, Hey, do you think you have meaning? And they'll say hundred percent. Yeah. But for, um, you know, Christians, and I, I, you know, I don't want to say Muslims or Jews because I don't, I don't necessarily know. But for a lot of Christians, they would say, well, you can't have meaning if there's no God in your life. And that, or, or maybe it's Jesus Christ specifically. And that just seems, to, I, I mean, I, it just seems to be false in my mind. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I actually uh, kind of semi-scandalized my students today. I said this, I said, you know, if I woke up tomorrow and for some reason I just became convinced that there was no God, right? Or, and that like materialism was true and you know, all that stuff. Right. I wouldn't love Jen any less. Mm. I wouldn't. And I don't think I would go out and cheat on her either. Mm. You, know, <laughs> you know what I mean? I wouldn't love my kids any less. Right. And I wouldn't abandon them. Right. I wouldn't be less proud of them. Right. Um, I, I wouldn't, you know, it, it wouldn't take away the meaningfulness of, of, you know, the reading I do and the writing I do and, and the jujitsu I do and all that stuff. I, I don't, I don't think that would change. Do you see that? Mm. Um, and so it, I, I agree, right? Like that it, like what gives my life meaning, right? Is there are all these things that are in it, right? And these people that are in it. Okay. Do you see that now? Uh, it just, it happens that I think all of that stuff is connected to God, right? Okay. I am a theist, right? Okay. I am, I am, I am a Catholic Christian, right? Okay. Do you, do you see that? Right. But if all, if that, if the whole metaphysical story just, I just suddenly realized it, I couldn't handle that anymore. I don't think it would change my love. Right. Mm. What right. do you think that is? Cause, um, uh, cause it would yeah. be it would be more common for someone to say, you know, if I woke up tomorrow and I was, and I didn't, I, and I, and I, I switched my belief to, to think that materialism is true. Yeah. You know, some, some theists would say, well, now you no longer have meaning, but why would you, if you, if you, if you tomorrow were convinced that materialism is true, yeah. why do you say that you wouldn't, your attitude towards the things that you do and the people that you love, that wouldn't yeah. change. Yeah. And yeah. Especially, okay, go ahead, uh, go ahead, push, please. Oh yeah, just especially like uh, what you said that you know a lot of beliefs in like the mysteries of God mm -hmm. are primarily like behavioral dispositions. Like you yeah. know, if you believe that God is the ultimate end, um, yeah. you know, perfection itself that you want to orient your, yourself towards, 
wouldn't, wouldn't that change a lot of the um, sort of behavioral practices that give you meaning or would, would those just not like change their orientation? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, yeah, I'm probably not showing up at mass anymore, right? Yeah, okay. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I mean, I don't, I don't see God's existence as some kind of premise in a practical syllogism mm. that explains what I do with respect to, to Jennifer, right? Okay. And I don't see God's existence as, as a premise in a practical syllogism grounding, you know, what I do with respect to my children, mm. right? Um, such that if that premise weren't there, you know, the, the conclusion wouldn't follow or something like that. Do, you, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Uh, I can't help but love them, right? Yeah. I'm like stuck loving them, right? Um, and at the end of the day, right, like what really from moment to moment, day to day, gives my life meaning is my wife and kids, right? Mm -hmm. And my friends, and you know, right? but really my wife and kids, right? So, um, so yeah, if I found out, like, I, I, it's not my view, but if I found like God is dead, right? Okay. Um, I would, I wouldn't have an answer ultimately to why all this matters, but I would still find myself absolutely compelled, right? Right. To love them and to do these things that, that, that are the most rewarding things in my life. Right. For sure. You know what I mean? Because I didn't take up my love for Jennifer because I believed in God. Right. I didn't take up my love for my children because I believed in God. Right. I got thrown into all that. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and the God business kind of will help make sense of it overall. But even if I couldn't make overall sense of it, I don't think it would change my commitment to it. Cause I, I didn't choose that commitment. I think I just stepped in it. Right. Mm. Right. Okay. Right. Mm. Yeah. That's a very interesting point. I actually never thought about it like that. You know, it's not like I love my wife because I love, because, I uh, because of God. Yeah. You know, it's, it's not like I'm friends with Amos because I love God and then therefore I love Amos. I mean, I never really thought of it that way. Amos, yeah. have you thought of it that way? Uh, no, I, I, I think I get what you're saying. Like, um, you know, belief in God is not a practical, so it, you know, it's not a premise in a practical syllogism for every single sort of moral commitment in your life. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, no, I, I think Jennifer is a place of revelation of God in my life. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. I think my children are locales hmm. of revelation for God in my life. Hmm. Okay. But I'm not saying like that my interpretation of, you know, Jennifer as a showing up of divinity for me or my children as a showing up of divinity for me hmm. uh, is imposed on me such that an atheist is like in some sort of epistemic error if they don't see that in their children. Okay. Hmm. But I'll say this is do, do, do I, so do I love God? Um, do I love Jennifer because I love God? I wouldn't say that. Okay. Do I see God manifested in Jennifer and my love? Yes, mm. I do. Okay. Do I love my children because I love God? I would not say it in that causal sense. Right. Okay. But do I see God in the manifested in my love for my children? Yes, I do. I do. It's very interesting. There's, right. It reminds me of, um, so I was, uh, Justin Bieber has a song called Holy, right? Uh, I haven't heard that. Okay, yeah. So he has a song called <laughs> Holy, recent. and I only heard of it like when it came out with the music video and watched it. I'm going to check it out. If it ruins my day, I'm going to be pissed. <laughs> <laughs> but here's the thing, though. I watched that, I, you know, I, I watched that video quite skeptical, and I actually teared up at the end of the video. Yeah. Because, and I'm, I'm like tearing up a little bit inside, just about to talk about it, uh, but because something that, you know, this is not this. This is this could be me reading. You know, uh, deep into Justin Bieber's lyrics that he doesn't. In, he didn't even start off thinking. But something yeah. that I found moving was, you know, the song he was talking about how with his wife. You know, um, the, when he's with his wife, there's holiness in that, yeah. that holiness that manifests through his wife. And what for me really changed, not changed, but really touched me is the fact that. Part of the reason why I like that song is that when I'm with my wife or when I, you know, when I'm with my wife and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, con I'm just thinking about my wife. I, you know, what makes, what draws me to her is the fact that in her, there's a, there's a sense of holiness that's com that comes out, at least for me, you know, that yeah. I, I feel like I'm not saying that my wife is a goddess, but there's a sense of holiness that, is, that manifests in my wife such that it makes me 
it, it, it makes me more reverent of God through my wife. And it's just, it's, you know, it's, it's a deep reading into Justin Bieber that he may not even have, but that song is just. I, I don't know that the poet is always the best interpreter of his, of his, of his mm. poetry. Now we, now we may overestimate Justin Bieber by calling him a poet, but, <laughs> but I'm, but I'm, but look, he speaks, he's the language is the house of being and he speaks it. Right. So, yeah. you know, yeah, that's cool. Yeah. And so like what I would say, okay, when you say you, 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 you see holiness in your wife, you know, there's, there's, um, that's what I'm saying when I say like, I see my wife as this locale mm-hmm. for God or being itself to show up and to reveal itself through her. Right. You know, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, like this shining through, right. Yeah. Yeah. To, um, what's your wife's name, RJ? Kaylin. Kaylin. Yeah, Kaylin. With, Are you uh, married, man, Amos? No. Well, he's our eligible bachelor here, right? Yeah. <laughs> All women fight. shine through for him now, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Uh, do you, um, a- a- yeah, Amos, were you going to say something? Um, well, like, all right, is what you're you're saying about uh, like you know seeing God in in your wife? Is that sort of like a practical thing? Because um, you, so you're you're a Thomist, yeah, or in some. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm yeah, not really yeah. pissed of anything anymore. Yeah, but but I I, I walk with a, a great way with Thomas, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, because I th- I think uh, I'm trying to remember exactly where it is. I I think it's in his, the, the section on the will in the Summa. Mm-hmm. He talks about like um, you know, God God is the ultimate object of all desiring, and like every you know every yeah. sort of uh, material or like created thing that we yeah you know the goodness that we will in that is like sort of seen under the like aspect of, of yeah. like our willing of God. So like, are you, are you just offering like a, f- a phenomenology of, of like love and rationalizing it or like, yeah. a, do you mean like metaphysically uh, like, you know, loving of spouse is disconnected from loving of God? Cause I, I wasn't following your argument yeah. and you know, I, yeah, I, 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 clear. I think phenomenologically. Okay. Yeah. Uh, a necessary condition of loving of spouse is not uh, an explicit loving of God. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, all loving of all things is loving of God. Okay. Yeah. Right. Okay. Okay. As a, as a, met, as a metaphysical thesis. Right. Yeah. Okay. okay. I'm not sure how to give that meaning, but to experience loving someone. Mm-hmm. Right. Okay. Yeah. But what my point was is if tomorrow, for some reason, that, that Thomistic metaphysic was just no longer available to me, I just couldn't take it seriously anymore, say, mm-hmm. it, wouldn't, it would not change my love for my wife. I, I really don't think it would, right? Yeah. Because once again, I don't argue from the Thomistic metaphysic to the love of my wife, right? If no. anything, I argue from the love of my wife to the Thomistic metaphysic, right? Yeah. Like I have no other way of making sense of this crazy thing, right? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So can I, can I go back to um, maybe that point I was making about uh, religious practice in the Eucharist? Of right? course. And, 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 and I'm just using the Eucharistic example because it's my, I don't know what your religious traditions are or anything like that, but you've got something like that, right? Amos is basically Catholic. Are you basically Catholic, Amos? <laughs> I, go, I go to an Anglican church. Yeah. yeah. Close. Right? <laughs> yeah. I can't really pick at that, Amos. Right? <laughs> and IJ, are, are you reformed? No, no, Amos. So Amos and I were both hardcore reformed people. Yeah, hardcore yeah. neo-Calvinist. You know, thinking. You know, if you if you weren't a Calvinist, then you basically were in the ruts. You like you don't know what you're talking about. Sure, sure, sure. Until, until we read Thomas, and then both of us basically rejected uh, reformed thinkings. I, I would say, I mean, there's a group on Facebook called Reform Thomism. Yeah, basically a bunch of reformed guys who follow Thomas. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, no. I, I, yeah, I, I'm. I'm an Anglican. I would. With Amos. Yeah, I would specify more specifically and say that there's sort of like a, a narrow neo neo Calvinist neo reformed uh, evangelicalism that I, I definitely moved away from. Okay. Um, but like if you read Calvin himself, he's quite a Platonist. Yeah. Oh and yeah. That yeah. that doesn't get translated into the later tradition of Calvinism. Right. Right. So, so where I, where I wanted to go is, um, so, I mean, I, I think IJ knows this from earlier uh, conversations we've had and, and, and maybe Amos, you, you've seen all that, but 
So I, I sort of subscribe to this sort of hive mind thesis, right? Where I don't, I don't really see single human individuals as the bearers of belief, right? I see belief mm -hmm. as a participation in a history, in a, in a cultural history, in a biological history, in, in, a, in a world in that sense of like the modern world, the medieval world, or okay. Yeah. Uh, okay, and so um, I don't see belief as some kind of first order experience, right? Belief is a participation in something broader, okay? Mm -hmm. So I, I'm happy to say like whether or not, just using an example of my tradition, whether or not I'm a Roman Catholic, right? doesn't have anything to do with some kind of internal act of whether I affirm or deny a proposition. Okay. Because mm -hmm. I think a lot of these propositions are not the sorts of things we can internally affirm or deny because they're so removed from any possible like, like, like significant meaning to us. Right. Like transubstantiation. I'm using that example. Right. Yeah. By the way, for my employers, I'm not denying the doctor. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> as I sit on their property. Right now, okay. So, um, but so what is it to hold the belief it's to participate in that world okay yeah all right and um i think i could be even just utterly devoid of any internal emotional disposition towards that doctrine right and at times in my life i have been right but yet still a habitual participant in it right okay mm -hmm. and thereby still a perfectly good catholic believer Right. And probably the vast majority of, of just using my tradition of Roman Catholics who have lived, have, have lived that way. Right. This is, they were just, they were thrown into this. This is the soil they were planted in and they lived that life and they did this. And uh, I don't think they were any worse off as Catholics as the, you know, the, the sort of brightest, carefulest, you know, philosopher today. Right. right. Because what it is to hold significant life framing belief like that is not a first order subjective disposition towards affirming or denying right mm. it is it's a participation it's a it's a shared way of life yeah right and i think it's it could be i think it could be true of the reform tradition it could be true of any tradition or something like that right yeah yeah and uh, and, and that's why one of the, one of the reasons I, I think it's just so dangerous about our postmodern situation is where we are, we see beliefs as a kind of choice now. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, and how do I make a choice about a belief unless I have some sort of, especially one that, that is always evidentially under, underdetermined, like a belief of faith, right? Okay. How do I make a choice about that without some sort of, you know, first order individual subjective disposition towards it? Right. Mm -hmm. And so I think a lot of times now we're in, we're in situations where, real belief cannot come online, right? Because it's been so removed from the, 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 the worldly context that gave it significance and carried it. Yeah. Hmm. So, yeah. Go, go for it, Amos. Yeah. yeah. So, um, IJ told me that you gave three recent talks recently. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I went and I listened to them. They're really good. Yeah. yeah. Um, Thank you. Yeah. And I, I think like, um, you know, sort of, what you're, you're saying there is something that we reflected in those papers. Yeah, no, this does, has been on yeah, yeah, yeah. Does that make moral deliberation, uh, does, does that sort of like, um, you know, make more moral philosophy, like ethics closer to political philosophy, um, like deliberating about, you know, the morality of choices, uh, yeah. is deliberating about our patterns of life, um, and deliberating about ideology is to a certain extent as well. Uh, yeah. And it seems, you know, like if if that represents the way that humans actually come to our beliefs um like should we yeah like how, how do we get back to that like um yeah. what sort of intellectual resources do we have like i know that you draw on heidegger a lot yeah but it, it, it almost sounds a bit marxist to me as well uh just like that hmm. you know. yeah elaborate on the marxist thing yeah. sure like the the idea that like the like material conditions uh, yeah. and like, you know, behavioral patterns determine what yeah. we believe in some sense. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, I agree with that. Although I don't think, un, you know, unlike Marx, I don't think economics is ultimately what's driving it. Right. Okay. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, so, um, this, this kind of goes back to things we said earlier. If we have to deliberate about it, I think we're in, in trouble. Okay. <laughs> okay. 
right? Uh, and we do have to deliberate about it. So ergo, we're in deep trouble, right? Mm -hmm. okay. um, I, I think, uh, you know, the, Let's, let's just, okay, so I'm lucky. So I was, I, was, I was a cradle Catholic and, you know, like I fell away in my early 20s and then I got married and came back to it when babies came, which is just to say like, I'm Irish, right? Okay, okay, right, okay. <laughs> right. Um, okay. That's how we've always done it, right? You know what I mean? And so, um, you know, it was, it's funny, like for me, have, like, like having, like quit, quit practicing and coming back, it was just, it was just, it was just returning. It was not even returning. It was like, it was clear. Like I, I really didn't live very much differently. Right. Okay. Um, I was lucky that I had had, um, I had a cultural tradition very near to me. Right. And this comes out in one of the lectures you're referring to, right? Like when it came to my decision to marry, I, I look yeah. back on it now as I, I, I made my decision to marry as a Roman Catholic, even though at the time I told you, I don't believe a word of it. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because it was, it was, the, it was, uh, it, those are the reasons that were operative in the world I occupied, whether I knew it or not. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But what do we do now for so many of us who are worldless, the way Heidegger would put it now, right? Yeah. And we don't worldless have worldless as in as in like they have uh, the, the, no affiliation. Yeah, or just in not just with a religion, but just you know, like what I mean, like increasingly, what are we doing like with with social media, with everything? Like we're this this is one of Heidegger's like real worries about technology is. Um, it makes everything feel near to us mm -hmm. such that nothing is really near to us. Mm -hmm. Okay. So like right now I can very easily fall into this illusion that like Justin Bieber and, and Kim Kardashian and, you know, you know, sports stars, whoever are like a part of my life. Right. Okay. Um, but they're not right. Did you see that? And it makes me miss the real world that I'm involved in. Right. And we're constantly oriented to all these different things that are disparate to us, both, you know, sp literally spatially, but also, you know, emotionally and all these things. Okay. And increasingly we're making everything a choice, right? Like there's nothing that we're just thrown into, whether it's a religion, a political affiliation, um, a citizenship, a sexual orientation, or I should say a gender or something like that. You know, all these things have just become choices now. Okay. So, what is it that I can take as a given, right? To, to ground anything, right? Like what are the reasons, uh, you know, what, what is the, the network of meaning that I can take as a given that I can use to go forward, right? And, and, what, and increasingly what we've done, we're just stripping it away. We're just getting rid of that. We're, we're de-worlding ourselves, right? Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so what, what can we do? <laughs> okay, what can we do, all right? Um, and okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm running here, sorry, <laughs> okay, but, no, I'm curious. What can we do? Yeah. Okay. So there's a, okay. This, this I mean, I, I, I want, I want you guys to go, and I don't mean to be condescending here, right? But I want you guys to go read this book. Okay. okay. And I want everybody listening to go read this book, a book by a guy named Jonathan Lear. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You've probably heard of Lear, right? Yeah. He's yeah. A, he's like an Aristotle scholar. Yeah. Aristotle scholar. He's also a psychoanalyst too. Oh, okay. He's a, yeah. He, I think he's maybe the most interesting intellectual alive today. Right. Hmm. Uh, he's, at he's at University of Chicago. He wrote a book called Radical Hope. Radical, okay, Radical Hope. Okay. Uh, it's brilliant. It's a short little book. Um, hope. Yeah. yeah. Har it's from Harvard. Okay. I've been like shoving it down the throat of every one of my students for the last couple of years, right? Okay. Okay. And so what Lear does with this is, is it's, it's, um, it, it's sort of a biography of a guy named Plenty Coops. Okay, who was the last crow chief? Hmm. Uh, the crow, I, I think the crow might have been up to Canada too, um, but they were the last sort of plains, um, one of the last plains uh, Native American tribes to go, to go on to the reservation. Okay. Yeah. There's this very interesting thing that um, Plenty Coop, is it Coops or Coop? Any, anyway, I, I'm sorry if I'm, to any Aboriginal people out there, I'm sorry if I'm butchering this. Okay. Um, later, late in life, uh, a, a, a friend of Plenty Coop was uh, interviewing him. Okay. And these guys have been friends for decades. Okay. And he was, he was a white man. Okay. And he asked Plenty Coop to, to give him like an autobiographical account of his life. And it ended uh, the day he entered the reservation. Okay. 
Mm. And his friend said, well, wait, wait, you've been alive for like 30 years since then. Mm -hmm. You know, what happened? And he said, after that, nothing happened. Interesting. Nothing happened after that. And he said, you would be better able to tell me what happened than I could. Mm. Okay. Because what the idea here, what Lear interprets as is, is once Plenty Coop entered the reservation, the world, his world was over, right? His world was built around the hunt of the buffalo, right? And the, and the subsequent warfare over that and all that. And, and as soon as he went into the reservation, the world as he, as he could conceptualize it was over. His cultural tradition had come to an end, mm -hmm. okay? Um, and then the question is, is did, was this just kind of a, like, now was he just a nihilist, okay? And it turns out that Plenty Coop was much more sophisticated than that, okay? And so he was the last Crow chief, right? And um, there was pressure on him from two directions. So there was one direction who said, you know, this is kind of the, you know, the, the Al Qaeda terrorist wing of it, right? Who says, look, we cannot enter the reservation. We are better dead, <laughs> right? Than to go do that, right? And um, the other direction said, hey man, the white man has medicine, he has roads, right? It'll be cool, right? Let's just go be white people. Right. Okay. And it's an interesting thing that Plenty Coop wouldn't take either of these directions. Okay. And he has this dream and God comes to him in a dream and basically says that either direction is a failure of faith. Okay. So on the one side, um, the way I read it, this is not Lear's words for it, but the way I read it is the, the Al Qaeda, like we'd be better dead than to change. Right is um, it's the sin of presumption. It's to say the way our way is the only way God could go, mm -hmm. right? Okay, we're right. There's no other way God could manifest to us, but what we do. So better dead than this, right? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, no, pardon, 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 sin of despair, right? Okay, that's the sin of despair, right? The other direction was the sin of presumption. It's like, whatever we do, we're okay, right? You know, we, we can't go wrong. Whatever we do, that would be a manifestation of God, right? And Plenty Coop refuses both of these. Mm. And, he, and he's told to take the virtue of the chickadee. Okay. And the virtue of the chickadee, supposedly, I guess the, in, the, in, his, in his mythology, is the chickadee can listen and mimic, right? It can mimic the sounds of other things. It can find something in it. Okay. And so what Plenty Coop does is he enters the reservation and his attitude now is listening. He, it's Advent. He enters a period of Advent. He's waiting for God to show up again and show him the way. Okay. D does, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Right. And so I think what we're, what we may be stuck in is an Advent. Right. And we have to resist a kind of like crash and burn. We, we cling to the past because there's no other way it could happen. And we yeah. have to resist an absolute assimilation to this. Right. You see that we have to like be satisfied with that tension of listening. Okay. You see that. Okay. And I think what that tension of listening, though, is, is that we have to teach our children our traditions. Right. Even if we aren't sure if we adhere to them anymore, right? Because mm -hmm. we, we, we have to give them something, right? We have to give them a structure of life, right? We have to give them something that God could show up in, right? We can't just strip them of all things that are near and throw them into an empty world, right? Mm -hmm. We have to give them something, okay? Mm -hmm. Um. And so like, what do we do? I think we keep teaching the traditions, right? But we admit that, right? We're in a phase of listening. We are waiting, right? For God to show, to show himself to us. And humans are, humans are just, and uh, to use uh, the uh, mythology again, you need a story to, yeah. uh, to, to um, identify with, right? There's yeah. right now, part of the problem with, with contemporary society is, um, there's a lack of pro uh, there's a lack of story a cohesive story that's being told right. you know people are being pulled out liberalism part of liberalism is pulling families apart so and then you know going living into the cities living in like high rises i live in the high rise living in high rises yeah. you know very close compacted close to people you feel like physically you're close to a lot more people than you were if you were in your village or in in the boonies yep. but emotionally none of them are near to you none of them are near to you and there's a lack of story that has happened where, you know, in my, so my tribe, you know, they have their own story about their, the gods, how they works, all that stuff, all that stuff. Christianity, Christianity came, that took the place. Yeah. Now in the West, what I'm noticing is just, there's a total lack of, 
people like there's not there's nothing to, for people to identify, especially if they if they're not religious. There is no identification that's happening. So then right. they just pick and choose. Yeah. You know, boom, 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 and then try to create a cohesive story. And, and, and that's the sin of of presumption, hmm. right? Hmm. Whatever I do, it's gonna be fine, right? Hmm. You know what I mean? Uh, and I think I think we have to hold to our traditions. Right, but we have to be open that th- however these play out is going to be different than it was in the past. It's mm. going to be right. Yeah, but is there is there not a sense in which like like the liberalism that we live in is isn't it a story in some sense? Like there's, there's sort of a an interpretation of history gradually moving towards um, you know, our, progressive. Our, yeah, yeah, our particular political arrangement, yeah. and you know, gradually moving towards more and more freedom. Um, this is this is McIntyre of whose justice with rationality like like yeah liberalism is the story that claims to have no story right yeah yeah um, it is, I, yeah, there's yeah. there's a guy who published a book uh, I read it in the fall like uh, last like a year ago yeah. uh, I think it's called like the enchantments of mammon I can't think of the author's name but he yeah. argues like um, you know the way that we talk about like invisible hand economics and the the market is you know we're we're borrowing theological terms to talk about yeah. it so there is like a yeah, you know, a subtle mythology and like a subtle See, but I wonder though. Okay, that's true of classical liberalism, right? I think that's, yeah. that's true of the liberalism of J.S. Mill, right? Yeah. Okay. I wonder now though, what we have in in the sort of postmodern version of it, like the woke version of it, right? Right. Seems to be just a destructive doctrine. <laughs> Seems to be just uh, a saying no to any attempt to connect to anything larger, right? Yeah. Right. Uh, I, that's a worry. Now, is that, is that a psychological possibility for humans? Interesting question. But I think it seems there's at least an attempt here, a conscious attempt um, to be storyless so we can make everything uh, an ungrounded choice. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm. You know, so um, well, it, it kind of in this connection, right, this is one of my biggest worries about COVID, okay, is um, I, don't, I don't know what, what's, what's happened with um, – the, the ability of, of churches to hold services in Canada, right? Okay, but, you know, there were uh, a few months here in, you know, even the American Midwest where, you know, we couldn't go to mass, right? Yeah. Okay. And even now the bishops have, or at least our bishop has, has given a dispensation. You don't have to go if you don't feel safe, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Mm-hmm. And, you know, what happens at mass is, you know, you're wearing a mask and, you know, there's no singing and it's like, it's a really alienating experience in a lot of ways right Mm -hmm. um i wonder how many people were you know hive minders going to mass out of a kind of a cultural momentum which i think is fine i think that's how most of it does are never going to come back Mm -hmm. right like how long can we suspend the traditions that ground our being in the world and expect that they're going to come back yeah right like how many halloweens could my kids miss right before halloween is no longer us Right. Uh, but then once Halloween's no longer us, we're not the same that we were and we don't have anything to fill it in with. Right. Yeah. Right. That's why we are trick or treating tonight, man. Do you think there would be, <laughs> I'm sorry, we are trick or treating. Right. Do you think there might be two be houses, but damn it, we're going to do it. Right. Yeah. You just gotta be like, yo, what's up? Give me some yeah. sweets. Yeah. Um, would, would you, would you think though that, you know, with, with people having been stuck inside of the house, uh, so, Oh, I don't even know if I was talking the mic correctly. Uh, if people being stuck in the in the house for the past eight months, right? Mm-hmm. Church has been. I mean, in Canada, a lot of churches are still online. Um, I think it's like thirty percent. Amos, you can correct me. I think it's like thirty percent of your capacity you're allowed to be in church. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And you know, that's it's never thirty percent. It's like way less. But the thing is, do you think? say COVID comes and it just disappears like the Spanish flu just like randomly disappeared, never showed up again. Depending on the election results. Right? Yeah. <laughs> that's, a, that, that's something we should talk about. Um, Maybe. Yeah. Do you think there would be a, you know, the, you know, instead of, a, instead of a, uh, instead of churches having completely uh, empty churches, instead, do you think that COVID, because people have missed that interaction, you know, that humanness is gone. They'll be like, okay, I got to go back to church because that's where I can find community. And I've had no community for eight months. I pray months. that that's the case. I mm. pray that that's the case. Right. I just I hope that that's the case. Right. Yeah. But like, since the summer, there's been a lot of weird, you know, I don't know how it is um, 
where you are, but like at, at least like in, in major city, Canadian cities, like, you know, restaurants have opened up again, like restaurants, I think it opened for like a month before churches were allowed to host people again. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, like people are getting back into some of their regular social habits, like seeing yeah. friends at restaurants, mm -hmm. but yeah. they haven't been getting back into others like church. At, at least in America, you know, there's a lot more sales tax that gets paid at restaurants than churches. So I think that might. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And so, uh, you know, one thing, um, another, another uh, really good, and, and I think, you know, it date it's dated but i think it's an important and, and should be returned to book is work by a guy named christopher lash okay who was a, a a political theorist you know kind of a chattering classes guy uh, in the late 70s early 80s had been a marxist and then kind of has this evolution towards i'm gonna, I'm gonna be careful calling him conservative right but to a kind of social traditionalism right mm -hmm. he's a catholic uh, was he yeah yeah, that's it. Yeah, I don't. I don't know what his religious disposition was. Okay. Actually. Yeah, revolt uh, of the elites. Yeah, he wrote a, a, a brilliant book called um, uh, "Culture of Narcissism." Okay, yep. mm -hmm. but my favorite of his is one called "The Minimal Self." Okay, mm -hmm. and in the Minimal Self, and he's he's got a, he's got a Freud thing. You got to like really wade through a lot of Freud <laughs> to, do, to do Lash, but. Um, He's writing that in the early 80s, and it's the height of the Cold War. And, there, and in America, at least, there was this huge survivalism uh, movement, you know, like, like it, you know, this like doomsday prepper thing, you know, people forming militias, getting ready to survive the nuclear holocaust, right? Okay. And um, Lash, and I, I find this a brilliant, brilliant notion, has this view that once survival becomes your absolute biggest concern, you're, you're basically a nihilist now. Mm. Okay. Why is that? Well, because it, when it becomes a matter, I just want to be alive. Mm -hmm. Even if all the things I hold dear in this life were gone, right? I just want to be alive, right? Um, he sees that as, as that, that's a kind of like, like radical individualistic nihilism, like that, that what makes survival important is that i that i live for the sake of these institutions mm -hmm. not that i just be alive mm. yeah. right um that what makes human life human life is our participation in the these histories these cultures and things like that and like to be constantly obsessing about my survival after the death of my world right uh, last season, well, that wouldn't, that wouldn't be survival. That would be the death of yourself, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, you might like continue on biologically or something like that. And you, well, I could keep my family going or something like that, but that's, that's this radical individualist notion to think that somehow we don't exist as social creatures involved in the institutions of other people and things like that. Okay. Mm -hmm. And, and he, he saw like this, this idea of just live at all costs, just stay alive at all costs, no matter what. Right. Um, that he saw it was like kind of giving up right yeah. on the social and so like like with covid okay yeah I, I don't i have my views okay but i'm not, I'm not going to get into like what the actual level of threat of it and stuff like that is but it does seem like we've, we're taking this turn toward like just number one priority keep human beings alive period full stop mm -hmm. right even if we wreck what makes life meaningful for them right in the process that's right. very that's a very good point right mm -hmm. and so like, stay alive for what to go back to a world where we've lost halloween right where we've lost i mean i mean you know you might make a big deal of that one out it's but it's today yeah. right okay mm -hmm. yeah yeah uh where we've lost halloween right where we've lost the mass mm -hmm. or you know what, what your tradition too okay uh you know where we've lost jujitsu where we've lost all these, well then what am i going back to i'm going yeah. back to being a hairless ape is what i'm going back to mm. i'm mm. not going back to be a human mm. Right. So if we if we wreck our meaning given institutions just to stay alive, mm -hmm. we're returning to be hairless apes. Right. We're, we're returning to be Nietzsche's last man or to be Lewis's men without chests. Hmm. Yeah. There's. Um, and to me, it's not worth it. Yeah. It's not worth it. Yeah. In early Greek literature, banishment from the city is almost seen as being equivalent to death because you don't get to participate. And, you know, we're like 
being in the city is seems yeah. kind of equivalent to being alive. Everything that what happens to Oedipus. Yeah. Yeah. And man, Amos, like I'm, I'm going like 20 points to Gryffindor. That's awesome. That's a good, right? <laughs> <laughs> excellent man. Not that it's mine to give out the points, but yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. I'm gonna use that in class, man. <laughs> yeah. Is 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 there and so with with COVID, you know, something that that there's a total inconsistency with with the whole COVID thing, right? Some protests are not dangerous for COVID. Some protests are very dangerous for COVID. You know, yeah. Black Lives Matter protests super safe for COVID, even if you're not wearing mask. Mm -hmm. Any any protest that's anti masks, uh, freedom protest, they're they're considered yeah. dangerous. Uh, but so you know with covid and you guys have an election coming up in yeah. three days right Jim? you may have heard this right yeah yeah <laughs> and yeah. and i think the this podcast is releasing on wednesday miss after yeah. the yeah so after the right. after the election the day after yeah. what yeah so i mean like for you i'm not i'm not, uh, like what what's the what's your sense in all of this with covid the election coming up mm -hmm. joe biden not remembering anything uh, hunter biden this laptop, yeah. you know, like there's so much going on in the USA that it's yeah. absolutely nuts yeah. to follow. Yeah. Is it, you know, is it, is, do you think, do you think it, it, the whole, the, the, the amount of controversy or the amount of, I don't know what the word would be, like attention that all these things are getting, is that, is that, uh, is that being perpetuated by COVID, you know, people being indoors and they're being so angsty that they're coming out with all these things? Yeah, I mean, there is just the, the mechanical fact that people are just sitting inside, like watching CNN and Fox News and getting frothy, right? Okay, there is that, right? When, yeah. when, and here's the thing is, is um, we've wrecked civil society, right? You know, civil society is that thing that sits between the individual and the government individual and like power elites, right? You know, we've, we've, we've wrecked all our social institutions or we suspended them temporarily, okay? So now it's just direct contact between the media and the individual, right? Uh, and it, or the government and the individual. You, you see my point, okay? Mm -hmm. And so now, like you think of it, like so, like the, just using the media's example, like uh, everybody's been isolated down to a nice, neat, manageable unit, right? On Twitter or Instagram or watching CNN or watching Fox News, something like that. And so now it's just a direct beam, right? To that individual mm. right and that individual isn't distracted by all these things in civil society right like their kids soccer league or you know their school or their or their their church you, you know what i mean so everything's been pushed out of the way so it's just the individual is just this object of domination mm. by these information empires right okay and so then suddenly what those people have to say has an outmoded importance in our lives than it did at any other point in history because all the other things that filled our lives have been, you know, been, been shut down. Right. Mm -hmm. Do you see what I mean? So, I mean, once again, this is like one of my ungrounded sociological claims, but I think that's part of what's going on here. Right. Is uh, we've, we've stripped the individual of civil society so that there's nothing mediating to the individual or distracting the individual from what um, information power elites want to be heard and seen. Right. And so then what they have to say is, is taking up an unholy, if I may, right, amount of space in our lives. Yeah. What are you yeah. what what are your thoughts on the these information gods? Uh, yeah, I like that. Yeah. Right. The information yeah. you know that Twitter, for example, has over, you know, uh the most recent one I can think of is is Hunter Biden. You know, it, there was all these um articles that came out and then Twitter Twitter actually uh, would take down any posting of Hunter Biden. You know that all that controversy on Hunter Biden, post, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, and they would just block it. What does that What does that say in terms of a society where, you know, Twitter is a public-private sphere, right? Yeah. It's it's public in so far as anybody can be on it, but it's private in so far as it's owned by Twitter. I mean, it's a public yeah. company; it's traded, um, but you know, it's private. You know, Jack Dorsey being the CEO, and but that that, that monopoly let's say that Twitter has or Facebook has over the content that's being produced. You know, let's say we release this and they're like, oh yeah, Jim has said some stuff. 
IJ has said some stuff. Amos has said some other stuff. So now this whole episode is going to get pulled off Spotify yeah. because, you know, these guys are yeah. too, too controversial. Like that says something about human beings being able to converse. Yeah. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. But, but also though, um, this goes back to the, the, that Heideggerian point I was making about technology earlier. You know, so much of what's mediated to me through the through the information gods is not really near to me, and it's a distraction from what is near to me, right? And I think, you know, our only way out is to try to recover what really is near to us, right? To to just just to look away, and look at what is the closest to us and what is constitutive of our lives, right? Because. 99.99% of the things that I can get worked up over on Twitter, right? Really have jack shit to do with my life. Right. Right. Okay. Um, and I'm not, I'm not saying like put your head in the sand and don't be politically engaged and stuff like that. Okay. But um, political engagement, social, like, like, you know, big scale social engagement, right. Um, is not what is most important to our lives, right? It is not what is nearest to us, right? And I think our only way out of this is not praying that somebody does something to break up Twitter like they did, you know, Ma Bell in the in the twenties. I, mean, I, I hope they do it. Okay. Um, so who, what's what's Ma Bell? That was the the um, the Bell phone company in the United States that had oh. this like incredible monopoly and was like you know charging people incredible rates for oh. did you phone use in, in I think it was the nineteen twenties. No, it was later. It was, it was the thirties, I think. And if I'm historians, please correct me. Excuse me. And so um, the the there was there was an antitrust uh, law put in place that broke them up. Just said we're we're gonna like force you to break into small. You have to sell the shares to someone else and break the company up, right? Mm. And maybe something like that will happen with Facebook or Twitter. I hope it does, right? Okay, or something goes on, right? Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, um, that doesn't return me from being distracted from the real world. And that's what we need. Mm. Right. And by the real world, you're, you're talking about being close to your family. Um, I, I got yeah. relationships in general, the traditions that make my life, my life, right. Mm. You know, all these things. Right. Right. Is there a sense in which city life, Amos and I both live in cities, yeah. Jim, you live in the city as well. I, I live in a, uh, thriving metropolis of 10,000 people overlooking the Missouri river in rural Kansas. Yeah. And this is not an accident. Yeah. Okay. So that's, a, that's, yeah. that's, that would be the question. Is there something about city life such that it, it drains people just by living there? Is there something unhuman about it? Um, I mean, I, I don't know. So, are, okay. Are we talking about like, you know, Hell's Kitchen, New York in like 1947, you know, where you had these like this vibrant Irish, you know, immigrant community, right, of people who knew everybody in their tenement, right, and the kids could play in the street and things like that. I don't think it's necessarily just the scale of the number of people in the area, right? It's whether or not there's the cultural tradition in place that holds us there, holds us in nearness together, right? Okay. Yeah. I think cities tend to break it up more easily, okay? But I think the question isn't just how many cars are on the streets or something like that. I think it's, it's whether or not there is, in fact, a world right, that is that place, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, one of the things I think is an interesting problem, I think even, maybe even um, Jordan Peterson has talked about this, but I know there's a lot in literature and psychology about some of this is, you know, so like human beings probably came online mostly dealing with a world of, of like a couple dozen other human beings in their band, right, in their, in their tribe. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and it was pretty easy to have a place there. Right. Okay. There's a hierarchy, right. There's some guy who has more wives than you do or something like that. Okay. But, and so they, maybe you're not like the biggest, strongest guy and you can't throw the best rock to kill the tiger or something like that, but you can like, get good at chipping a rock or something like that. And so like everybody had a place and everybody could like kind of see themselves uh, as valuable and like contributing to the tribe. Okay. Uh, Cause everything was at, at such a small scale. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. But now what do we do? Like you turn on your, your, you know, you go on the internet, you go on Twitter, you go on Facebook, you are constantly comparing yourself, not with a couple dozen people in your band, but with the whole damn world. Right. Mm, yeah. You know what I mean? Like, like, you know, like 
IJ, you're a grappler, right? Okay, I'm a grappler, right? And Amos you know, will soon be a grappler. Oh, dude, Amos. <laughs> well, dude. It's 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 fun. It's fun, but I've not joined a club. <laughs> That's right. Good, good man. You're you're, you're just, it's like Half, halfway there. Yeah. Halfway there. Yeah. Yeah, because Amos, Amos, you, you you came with me once, right? I have definitely with you a couple of times. Yeah. So but let's say, let's just say you know uh, you know you were a grappler, a wrestler, in, in like you know 1850 in Missouri. Okay, mm-hmm. right, where I, or, or Kansas, where I'm sitting right now. Okay, you know, so you you know you probably like wrestle around with guys in the county, you know, at during the county fair or something like that. Do you know what I mean? And, and you could get a sense of yourself as being pretty good, maybe the best guy among these guys, right? Okay, but now you know, uh, IJ goes to the gym and he has a great night rolling, right? And you you choke out some dudes. Some of the dudes choke out, choke you out. You feel pretty good. Then you go home. You turn on a video and there's like some black belt, you know in another country doing something amazing that you can't do. And you realize he's ranked number one in the world. You're not even ranked something like that. So what have you done? You've like compared yourself on a scale, right? Mm. That human psychology was not designed to compare itself on a scale. Do you, you know what I mean? And so this one is why I don't watch videos at all, really of other, of other people, like, like the big time. Like if you ask me like, like trivia about the sport, I wouldn't know it. Right. Because for me, it's about participation in this thing with my band of brothers and sisters in this time and in this place. And I don't want to be distracted by depressing facts about how I don't measure up to, right, like these these other people all over the world. That's not near to me. Do you see what I mean? And I think we're constantly putting ourselves of like comparing ourselves to humanity on a global scale, right? That distracts us from like the real thing in front of us. And, and that distraction is always put into the way bottom of a hierarchy. Yeah. Right. And so I, I think it, it's wrecking self-esteem. It's, it, it's causing anxiety, all this stuff. Whereas you just were concerned like about what's going on in the soil you're planted in mm-hmm. and didn't compare yourself with things on a global scale. Weren't concerned always about what's going on in North Korea or Washington, DC or Ottawa or right? okay. Okay. Uh, and just looked at what's going on in your life mm-hmm. There's a liberation in that. And it's really what we were made to do. Mm. It's a sense of um, uh, returning to uh, your tribe. Yeah. Hmm. And, we're, and, and, and the thing is, we're distracted from our real tribes because we're constantly going on Twitter and seeing what somebody in three time zones away is doing. Hmm. What about like, um, Amy, sorry, can, were you going to say something? Go ahead. Uh, like, do you do you, Jim? Do you take this across to other domains? You know, mm-hmm. as a philosophy professor, yeah. you know there are you know there are well-known philosophy professors like uh, what's his name, Daniel Dennett, being yeah. the most famous one I can think of. Yeah. Um, do you, do you take that do you take that attitude across all domains in your life? I I, I very much try to do so. Okay. Right? Like I, I, there was a time in my life where I really punished myself because I wasn't publishing enough. Right. Mm. Um, even after I wrote this book that, you know, if I may, it's had a lot of like really good influence. Right. Okay. And, um, and I was, I, I would, would be punishing myself. So I'm not publishing more and I'm not like measuring up, you know, to like the dentists of the world and stuff like that. And I, and I got to this point now, like, look, uh, that's not what I do. That's mm. not, that's not where I am. That's not what I do. That's not. And, and if you believe in Providence, that's not where God put me. Right. Okay. And uh, what is really important? What is near to me? What is direct to me? What actually makes a difference for my life? And what is a fantasy that's put in my head because we've been given access to more than human beings should have access to. Hmm. Is that, Okay, and so, it's not an excuse to be a wuss and yeah, not yeah. try hard, right? Right. But yeah. It's, it's that's what is my task. Yeah. So how? So did you ever watch? Did you watch that new documentary that that's on uh, that's on Netflix called The Social Dilemma? No, I haven't seen it. I'm writing it down right now. Um, and that you you've never heard of it, Amos? No. Okay. Well, it's it's a it's a document that just came out, and you know it's produced by I think it's produced by Tristan Harris. Tristan Harris was a like a Google ethicist. And he was the guy who said, hey, yo, guys, we got to change the way we're doing it because we're pretty, according to him, we are um, reprogramming the human brain into, yeah. into what, uh, what other, certain people have called a short-term dopamine release, right? So when you're on Instagram, you scroll, you, you scroll down 
and you're looking for that notification. Exactly. You're looking for that notification. Boom. And here's a, here's a su- super interesting thing that I didn't know about until a few months ago. So remember when Facebook came out 2005, I think that's when it went kind of public. It went across the, you know, other schools and stuff. When it went public to the rest of the world, here's something that's very interesting to uh, Facebook. Um, when they first introduced notification, it was notification appeared in blue, right? It appeared in blue. And what did they find out? Their engineers um, and their trackers and their designers, what they found out was that nobody was really engaging with the notification that they were receiving. So they would get on the phone, but it's blue. And then they would go and lo- they would log into, tw- uh, sorry, they would log into uh, Facebook. Notification, you have three notifications, but it's in blue. Nothing was happening. So then one of them or a few of them said, okay, what if we turned it red? Right, psychologically, red being the something that uh, sparks you and you know gets you all uh, hyped up. They changed the notification to just the color red, and it completely transformed the interaction. Yeah, people are coming on Facebook more frequently, pressing that notification. So now that's why you'll notice um, if you have. I mean, now they've kind of changed it. But Facebook, they would they give you like the most useless notification. Yeah. You no. Know? Hey, today you took this photo. You want to look at it? You're like, oh, I have one notification. You click and it's the most useless notification. But you've got that short-term dopamine release. Yeah. And and so anyways, this uh, so- Social Dilemma is talking about how social network platforms are transforming, especially younger uh, what Gen Z's lives. You know, I, I mean, it, they kind of go a bit apocalyptic with what Amos was saying. You know how Amos, you were saying just to us, how uh, in that mammon, ma- ma- mammoth, oh, what's that book? Enchantments of mammon. Yeah, now they're saying that theology was brought in into liberalism, like a theological uh, understand. So in this documentary, it's very similar. Where they, it's it's like <laughs> it would basically be like if you took out Christianity and replace it with technology, and the the way it concludes is you know if we don't do anything about it, the world's going to end. You know, because of social networks, which is, you know, it's a bit over the top, but it goes to your point about Jim. People are now trying to connect. There are girls and boys, young dudes who are trying to compete with, you know, Photoshop pictures. Yeah. yeah. And they're getting depressed. Yeah. And, and that's tough, you know, for these yeah. people, for these kids. I, I, I mean, Jim, obviously you're a few years older than Amos and I. I don't couple. know. Just a couple. You. What do you, uh, when you were growing up, when you were 16, what were you doing? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I was, I was, uh, I was playing football and I was reading books, right. You know, uh, uh, trying to make out with real girls, not looking at porn. Right. I mean, do you, you know, I mean, like, you know, none of this stuff was there. Right. Yeah. You know, uh, you know, I mean, we, I mean, it, to a degree, I mean, TV was still there. Cable was still there. Right. Okay. You know what I mean? we're on our way to it. Right. But, um, I, I think that pressure and you see this in teenage kids, I have teenagers like to compare yourself to things on a global scale. I think that is really, really the problem with all this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just curious, like what sort of, you know, do you have practical solutions for dealing with these things? Um, yeah, I mean, um, Take your I mostly and flush just don't involve myself with social media, right? What's that? I mostly just don't involve myself with social media. Okay. Right? Um, yeah, I, I, I have a Facebook account uh, only because my jujitsu gym only communicates through Facebook, right? And and there are some people, like, so for instance, my, my son in the Marines, uh, Facebook messaging is going to be really useful. For yeah. Podcasts. Okay. But that's taking something very near to me and using the media to keep it near, right? Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't, you know, um, you know, I played around the podcast for a while and we have a, we have a, um, a Twitter account dormant for that basically. Right. Yeah. Uh, But I don't follow anyone on Twitter. I don't. Yeah. I mean, so I I pretty much stay away from social media. Right. Okay. Um, and now does that mean like, so I, I mean, so this is something like my wife and I talked about quite a bit. Okay. So I, you know, in all modesty, I think I could have a social media empire, right? Like this weird combination of like philosopher, jujitsu world champion, fitness guy, you know, you know what yeah. I mean? Um, but I want to, I want to live in the real world, right? Mm-hmm. 
yeah live in what is truly near to me right and so i'm just i'm just not going to do it even even if it like costs me an opportunity that i could have to aggrandize myself or even like in you know enrich myself financially i'm just not i'm just not going to do it right i came very close to doing it at one point i decided it's it's going to fundamentally change my life i won't do it yeah mm. right now um uh i my, my kids have cell phones right uh um i've of my well actually no when they when they drive and here they can drive when they're 16 we we get them a cell phone because i think that's a very good technological thing yeah. to have a teen rolled out and about with a cell phone right okay when they're driving okay um we we say they can get a facebook account then okay but then but they know like i'm going to be looking at that thing quite a bit right and i'm going to look i'm going to be looking at how often they're on it and all that okay yeah of the three of my kids who have had who have gotten to 16 years old only one of them took us up on having a facebook account only mm -hmm. one of them did. the other two yeah, i don't know if any for it right and the one who did barely wow. used it. yeah that's surprising um, to hear teenagers yeah they just they didn't feel pressure to do it and they have friends at school and they're in a small town and they have access to those friends and they're not particularly into like talking to them electronically when they have a five minute drive or a, or a 10 minute walk to get to them. Right. So yeah, of, of my three teenagers that I've offered the opportunity to have a Facebook account, only two of them, only, pardon me, only one of them took me up on it. Hmm. Yeah. Is, is your, you know, previously you had mentioned that uh, it was not, it's not a mistake that you, you're living in a town with 10,000 yeah. people. Yeah. What, like, can you, can you go further into that? I mean, we've had opportunities to leave. So when we, when we moved here in 2003, the plan was to be here a year and, and, and go, <laughs> right? Okay. It's not a very prestigious job, all that, right? Okay. You know, a lot of teaching and all that. And, you know, every, and I've had opportunities to go, you know, my wife's had opportunities we could go. Okay. And every time it's come up, right. When we looked at what we were trading, right. It just wasn't worth it when i when i look at the life my kids have okay so um my kids uh one, one of the few things that are absolutely mandatory for my kids is they have to join the ymca swim team do you know what ymca is do you have that in canada mm -hmm. yeah so why the swim team um because it's hard as hell <laughs> right yeah ymca they're just because any swim team is okay oh, okay and, and the only swim team in town is so what happened was my oldest kid didn't like when he was young, he was like one of these, if you poured water over his head in the bathtub, he would scream. Mm. Oh gosh. It's like one of his buddies in Marines hear this. He's going to get, but no, right, here we go. <laughs> 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 he, would scream, he would absolutely, he would, he would scream. He, he was a water foe. Okay. Mm. Yeah. And I tried to get him swim lessons and just cause like from like a safety standpoint, I wanted him to be able to swim. And like, he would just scream. I'd have to get in the pool with him with the instructor. And, was, and then finally we got, look, we're going to traumatize this little kid. Some people don't swim moving on. Right. Mm -hmm. And then it was the Olympics um, after he was in fourth grade, the summer, summer Olympics mm -hmm. after he was in fourth grade, you know, he's, he's watching the swimming. He's like, I want to do that. Mm -hmm. And I literally said to him, I said, genius, they're not crying. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Those dudes are not crying. Okay. Mm -hmm. He said, no, I want to do it. I said, well, I said, if you can take a swim lesson and not cry, we'll talk about you joining the swim team. Okay. Hmm. And I think I pissed him off. Right. In a good way. Okay. Right. Okay. And so he, he does this like at the YMCA, this like two weeks, you will swim or you'll die course. Right. And he gets through it and he can kind of like do this ugly crawl and he like roll on his back and literally cough out the water. You swallow and you go back. Right. Oh. So, he got to where he could swim the lap so he could join the kids' swim team. So he joins the kids' swim team. Dude swims Monday, Wednesday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, four days a week, all fall. That was in September, October, November, December. And then in January, his coach says, I think you should do a swim meet. He was going to do one swim meet and then say, yeah, I did it. I conquered it. Moving on. Hmm. He does it. He, like, wins all the events. <laughs> oh, wow. Nice. And he was in. Right. He was in and it was hard and he did it. Right. Okay. And, and that was big. That was really, really big for like who this guy becomes. Right. Mm -hmm. And my wife and I saw that and we're like, Whoa, okay, this is cool. Um, and so what we did is we said that he's the oldest of the six kids. And we said, all of you have to join the team. Okay. And you have to, you know, we're not cruel. Okay. But we said, you have to be on the team 
long enough that you could swim well enough to do a meet. And then after you do that, you can quit if you want to, mm -hmm. right? And all of them stayed on the swim team through eighth grade when it just ends, there's no more swim team after that mm. uh, and loved it. But they got in there, they had a terrible month or two and they did it and they stuck with it. They overcame it. And it's like, like, we think it's important to put them in a situation where the only way out is to win, mm -hmm. right? Mm. Only way out is to win. And um, I tell you, it, it really has been a big difference for all of our kids, I think in their, in their ability to persist and resilience and you know deal deal with resolvable stress and stuff like that yeah so we have a requirement you all have to join the swim team hmm. i think we start them in like third grade or something like that okay i like that yeah isn't it yeah it's great okay i think in in swimming and piano because swimming and, and piano yeah, because they're hard okay right? yeah. I, like I, a... I can attest to piano being hard yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, both of which I suck at. And I, I, I was a terrible, terrible swimmer. And then I came to this conclusion, like, look, I cannot require this of my kids, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Unless I go in for it, right? I have yeah. to, I have to like hold myself to it too. So I remember the first time I did it, man, I could barely swim a lap. I was just dying, right? And I stuck with it for a year till I could swim a mile, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so I don't swim much anymore, right? Because you get to quit after you can, you, but, but yeah, I got to <laughs> mile and, and then kind of moved on yeah yeah Sw swimming is tough though you know, it is hard is, it's if very you difficult. ever swam against a clock oh gosh <laughs> everything everything in your like monkey brain is saying get the hell out of the water there's mm -hmm. no yeah <laughs> right you know and my daughter still swims in high school and she's she's very good yeah mm. and but anyway the, so so going back to the point is like you so said that ymca is about like five blocks from our house yeah. right mm -hmm. and so by the time all of our kids are like in third grade they walk out the door on their own to the YMCA. It is their job to get there on, on time for, for practice, right? And these are homeschool kids too. It's very important they get out, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it's their job to have a lock and a locker and, and go down there and do it and come back on time and all that, that, that sort of thing, right? How many people living in a suburb can say they can do that? Now? Mm. Just open the door and say, go to practice, kids, right? Mm. Yeah. Like, um, like right now, um, we, we homeschool our kids to eighth grade and then we send them to a, a Catholic high school. Okay. My two boys who are still homeschooled, right? I mean, they're both basically done with their schoolwork by, you know, noon, early afternoon. And then they spend the rest of their day running around the neighborhood with the other homeschool geeks, catching snakes, literally catching snakes, right? Nice. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, our, our, uh, we have a, we have kind of a policy. We're not, Trans, we will not transport you if you're going anywhere within a 15 minute, 20 minute bike ride from our house, right? Mm. Okay, so, so like the big thing is by living in a small town, I think ironically, our kids have a kind of independence from us that they would not have if we live in a big city or a suburb. Right? Right. That's one of the big, big, big reasons why we why we stayed in a small town. Mm. Right. Okay. Now, do you mind if I keep going with this? Of course. Yeah. Keep going. Now the real, because I, 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 I know you know this, I don't know if you know this, I lost a hundred pounds at one point in my life. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I would have done that if I lived in a suburb. Hmm. Okay, so Wait, did you lose your, did you lose your hundred pounds when you were uh, in Kansas? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, it's 2006. Yeah. Wow. And so, yeah. And so, um, but you know, I, I, I live in a town, you know, I mean, it's like when, when you go, to, when, you, when you live in a small town and you go to like a big city or suburb, you're like, you're kind of overwhelmed by like, just everywhere there's a sign come here and eat right everywhere there's a sign come here and do this do this there's yeah. so many options you're just constantly bombarded by it right um i don't know if i would have pulled it off right mm. if everywhere i went i was like constantly being bombarded with uh that now there's like fast food stuff in town here right but i can go days and days and days just walking around my neighborhood and not see any of that right right so there's kind of it's kind of a simplicity and a lack of temptation that like f helped me be more disciplined about this sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Right. And, and then also I think at a certain point in your life, and I think, I think you guys would probably get this. Greg, I think, I think I see this in your friendship, right. Um, at a certain point in your life, friendship, I think generates obligations. Right. Okay. And there are people I have now, you know, I have spent now 17 years with here. Right. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, I've, I've raised my kids with them and they've raised their kids with me. Right. And, you know, at a certain point, I think you just got to say, Hey, I'm, I'm making my stand here with these people. Right. Right. Yeah. I'm not going to be a transient my whole life. Yeah. Right. right. 
everything uh-huh. everything in life um, is has a compounding effect, right? The yeah. longer you're friends with someone, the better your friendship is, right? Yeah. Um, and that that's something where uh, I think Jim, I think this is something that I actually now that you're going through all this, uh, explaining all this, it's something that's it's making me think even more. You know, there's this the and Amos and I have talked about this, and Amos, feel free to jump in. Um, yeah, Amos and I have discussed the, the 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 sort of strangeness in living inside of a city, right, yeah. where you're boxed in, and you know there's a lack of community. That 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 sense where your kids can just go out, go to the YMCA, bike around. You're not, you know, there's it's not like um you're not coddling your kids at all. No, no. And and the cod, coddling of, I mean. To to use that uh, to use Jonathan Hyde's book, coddling of the American mind is <laughs> coddling of the American uh, coddling of lots of kids' minds. That's an awesome book, by the way. Yeah, um, and so that you know, in in that book, uh, Jonathan Hyde talks about the, uh, the 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 kids whose parents were late from work, right, yeah. and they were outside playing basketball. Yes, and then yeah. the neighbors called yeah. the cops on them or called uh, social kids people i forget what they're called and they got the kids Apple taken away of some sort right yeah so you know that and like amos i don't know now that you're in toronto you've been there for three months or four yeah. months like do you feel the same about living in the cities that you previously had you know when we were talking about it yeah like i gotta say i don't like it as much uh i i grew up in a like super rural area so i grew up on the east coast of canada um, could see the ocean from, from our house. Uh, our neighbors had a hobby farm and like, we just like, you know, run around the beaches. Um, yeah, there's lots of little like niche places where you could sort of like scurry across the top of a cliff and then get to a secret beach that nobody else could get to. Do some dangerous stuff getting there. Yeah. 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 Um, and yeah, like, I think I had a great childhood growing up there. Um, but yeah, moving back to a big city, it's kind of alienating. Um, don't see very many people you know. Um, yeah, and you just don't get to know places as well. Right. You know, it, it, like, so interesting thing, because um, you could never, you, you of course, there, there, is, there is data, like, you, cities are probably safer now than they've ever been, right? I mean, yeah. No, I know, like, um, in the 19th century, the year that the World's Fair was in Chicago, is something like in the first six months of that year, there were 800 murders in Chicago that they knew about and probably many, many more in the first six months. Right. I mean, yeah. I'm not, I mean, like Chicago is a pretty dangerous place right now. Okay. But th- we're actually living in like the least violent period yeah. ever. Okay. But we perceive threat, right? Okay. We, but I think we project threat. And one of the things we project threat is we never have to deal with real threat. Right. Okay. But like, so my kids, I mean, like tonight, after dark, they'll go out and trick or treat, right? Okay. And like any night of the week, you know, especially in the weekends, my two younger boys, they'll be at the neighborhood park till after dark and they're going to walk home in the dark and they're going to like, you know, have to be in the dark and be scared and all that. Okay. They're going to catch snakes. We do all these things. And and so um, I'm not teaching them to see the world as a threat, Mm. right? Or if there are threats to understand how to deal with them not to be protected by by someone else yeah dealing with them and i think you probably had that amos in your child like you're out climbing cliffs and stuff like that and there were threats were dangers but you were put in a situation where you had to take a responsibility yeah the threat less frightening okay and and, you know one thing i want to start going back to the COVID thing like i wonder to what degree we have a generation of kids now who have just been told like because we're wearing masks right like every like i interpret myself as a threat to everybody around me and everyone around me, I interpret as a threat to me. Okay. Mm-hmm. And their, their disposition towards being now will fundamentally be fear, right? Mm-hmm. Threat. Okay. Mm-hmm. And threat that I need to be protected from, not that I can push back against, not that I can conquer, right? Do you, you see that? And so I just really wonder what the disposition of a generation of children who have spent a year like that is going to be like, right? Yeah. It was already bad on that score before this, right? Yeah, that's. We, I, I have some friends who who's um, who had kids, you know, just at the beginning of the year, in January, right? And now it's we're in September, October, and the majority of their life 
the, well, they're, they're eight months, you know, the first eight months they spent yeah. indoors, you know, yeah. with just their yeah. parents. Yeah. That's going to have developmental consequences. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. I mean, that is so, an and, interesting and, point. Going back to Jonathan Bates book. Okay. Yeah. I, I love that book. Right. Okay. Um, and, you know, and, and so I, I've always been, you know, pretty snotty about the Gen Z, iGen generation, right? With all these, these snowflakes with their, their anxiety problems and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, okay, okay, right, okay. But two things that hit me, that book yeah. and my wife uh, is, is now a therapist, mm -hmm. okay? Um, and my wife was like, yeah, okay, you're right. They're, but guess what? They really have the anxiety problems. Like they're not making it up. They're not faking it. They have the problem. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and hate says that too. Right. I mean, hate is like, he's no, no, they're, the problem is real. They're not making it up. They're not faking it. It's a, however, however you think you got there, they are really experiencing the anxiety. Right. Um, because they have never been put in a situation where they've had to resolve stress, right. Where mm -hmm. they had to do something about it. Right. That they have been protected. Uh, and then when they're put in a situation, like say being a college freshman, when you meet Dr. Madden, who does not care whether you pass this class or not, right. They've never, they've never had a threat like that before. Right. Yeah. They've never flown without a net and they, and in their natural response to that is utter complete debilitating anxiety. Hmm. Right? When you've been protected and you've never had to fight back and win, when you meet a threat, you, 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 you only have debilitating anxiety. Right. Mm. And I think that is a huge, huge problem. And, and I'm not trying to like pick on our assault but I see it. I, I didn't see it before. I used to just like have resentment, you know, just, right, okay, blah, blah, blah. My kids are Marine. Right? Okay. <laughs> you know <what> I mean? <laughs> now, uh, now I think I get it. Like they really do experience the stress and the, and the anxiety and it is debilitating to them. Right. How much, uh, um, uh, so, sorry, Amos, were you going to say something? No, go ahead. Okay. Every time you're like move forward, it's like okay, is Amos going to say something? The you, with your kids, you know, and Jim, I know we've talked about this before, um, but how much of your kids' ability to be independent is uh, has to do with you know the swimming that you put them in and the jujitsu? I think all your kids do jujitsu, right? Like, how much do you think? How much do you think those two things played in your kids' lives? Huge. It's huge. Yeah, it's very big. Is it? Yeah. I mean, one, I mean, like one thing we all have to like, like admit genetics gets a roll, right? Okay. Do you know what I mean? And I'm like, I'm the son of an ass kicker, right? Okay. My kids are the product of the union of two ass kickers, right? Okay. You, you know what I mean? So there, there is just genetics. Okay. But, okay. So leave aside the genetic account, right? Um, I think the fact that, that we, and I, I want to, I, I love my children. I show my children a great deal of affection, right? And I, ha I have the great privilege of having been raised by a three-tour combat vet in Vietnam who told me he loved me every day he talked to me his entire life, okay? Your dad, your dad was uh, in, in the Army. He was, was in the Air Force. He was, a, he was a combat air controller, which was like a very dangerous job. Hmm. Uh, and yeah, he did three tours. No, two tours, pardon me, uh, in Vietnam. One, one was extended, right? Wow. But yeah, very, very heavy combat experience, all that. Okay. But that man still, although he suffered gravely of PTSD, right? I found it after he died. That man told me he loved me and showed me physical affection every day that I was in his presence his entire life. Right. Uh, so I've never seen this like dichotomy between being like a tough guy and disciplined and like, resilient and like showing love and physical affection. I, I, that's like one of the great blessings in my life. Right. Mm. Okay. Um, so I don't, I don't want you to get the impression like I'm just like this cruel like drill sergeant to my children, right? You, you know what I mean? Yeah. I think you have to have both these things, right? Okay. Um, but I do think the fact that we have been willing to put our children into situations where they have to resolve something on their own that we cannot help them with, right? Um, then I think that has been very big for our kids, right? Mm. It, 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 right? And I'll say this is something, okay, and now there's probably people who say this is a cruel bastard, okay, but um, whenever one of my kids, like say they have, whether it's a swim meet or it's, um, uh, it's a jiu-jitsu competition or a wrestling match or a soccer game even, right, and they'll do the, and they've lost, right, 
the first thing they, they, they come out to feel, I give them a hug and I give them a kiss and they show them like this you, victory has nothing to do with my love for you. Right. Okay. And then a lot of times though, the kid will give you the like, well, it doesn't matter as long as I had fun. I'm like, no, it, the hell it doesn't, right? We're doing this to win, right? And if winning didn't matter, this wouldn't mean anything, right? You, you, you know what I mean? Yeah. It doesn't mean worthless, right? And, you know what I mean? Like, like you wanted to win that, you just lost. Big deal. You see what I'm saying? But and yeah. the possibility of failure, it's the possibility of loss that makes this worthwhile, right? Mm. Do you know what I mean? So I've never let them have, whether it's school or sports, say, well, it's what matters is I try or what matters. No, it, that doesn't matter, right? It matters to win, okay? It doesn't mean you're worthless if you lose, right? Because nothing matters if there can't be losing, right? But you have to admit you wanted to win that thing, right? Mm -hmm. and next time you're gonna try harder to do that. Did you, you, see, you see my point, right? Mm. And I've been able to have that attitude and I've not wrecked them with it, right? That's, that's very interesting. The, cause usually you have, um, is, is Amos, this is, this is, this is, this is a real report, right? Where in Ontario, the, it, in 2015, they had that, uh, soccer game with no, with no goals. Oh yeah. 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 Right. No, no points. No I points. Quite a comment. Like without death, what would it mean? <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. And so with that, how much of that, you know, Jim, that attitude in terms when it comes to mortality, and we were talking about this previously. Yeah. yeah um, you, you had mentioned, you know, when we were messaging each other, you had mentioned the, with COVID, the, the mortality, there was a sense people were just living in fear and um, survival was the only thing you wanted to do. Um, yeah. You know, you would, uh, at least if you were with Kierkegaard, you know, you face death, you face mortality, yeah. and then you, you deal with that. But now, you know, we're not really dealing with that. And you, I, I'm trying to remember what you said to me on text. And I was like, hey, hey, save this for the podcast. Uh, um, so I'm actually going to pull yeah. this up. <laughs> I, I think I can, I can make this same point and run it back to the sports thing. Do you mind? Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah, go ahead. With my three oldest kids, all of them now. And actually, no, my four oldest kids. Okay. And it, and it, it could have come up in a context of playing the violin. It could have come up in a context of academics. It just, it just so happened to come up in sport. Okay. Um, and I'll start with my, my son, one of my, my second oldest son, he had a, ma a wrestling match last year mm -hmm. where both he and the guy he was wrestling had like asthma attacks during the match. Mm -hmm. Okay. And neither of these little sons of bitches quit. Right. Okay. They, they went at it. They went at, it went to overtime. Yeah. Right. And they're both like turning blue. Okay. Right. And there's part of dad's like, oh, I need to, I need to like jump on the mat and say, this is over, but I didn't do it. Okay. Like there's medical people there. They know. Okay. All right. My son, Pat wins it in overtime. Mm -hmm. He runs in the locker room and just barfs his guts out. Mm -hmm. He comes out. And I said, um, Pat is from the dad's end. I got what I want out of wrestling mm -hmm. because you just showed me you think there was something more important in life than not being in pain. Mm. You showed me there's something more important in life than just being alive. And I said, I can trust you to marry my daughter-in-law now. I can trust you to marry, to raise my grandkids. Mm -hmm. So if you never wrestle again, I don't care. Mm. Anything you do now for me, is just, I'm going to enjoy it. Right. You've shown me that like honor, right commitment is more important than just being alive that's right? powerful it's powerful right and i remember my daughter um uh the first time she really really put out in a 500 meter swim uh -huh. right it was her freshman year of high school and just just wrecked herself to win that race right and i said the same thing to her i said yes as far as what dad wants you just you just showed me that and just now for me i'm just this is just entertainment for me now Right. And my oldest son and, and my, my, uh, my one who's 14 is a cross country runner. He had that moment running cross country this fall where, you know, and, and I said the same thing to him. Right. And so this is, I think going back to that point is, and it's going back to other points we made is um, to be human is to be willing to wreck yourself <laughs> over a point of truth or honor or goodness or virtue. Right. Mm -hmm. 
you see that. And if we let COVID make survival more important than the civilization that mediates truth and goodness and honor and courage to us, then, then we've just given up. We're nihilists. Right. Uh, so wait, wait, so I, I got the, I got the Facebook message pulled yeah. up. Um, yeah. This this is this is what you said, and I said, "Keep this for the podcast." You said Hegel basically says that human spirit comes in line initially when someone says, um, "I have a right, and you've done, and you'd have to kill me before you could change my mind." Yeah, I'm a right. I'm a right. Sorry, I'm a right. Not I have a right. Can you can you expound on that? Yeah. Okay. In a lot of ways too. I think I think Hegel is like the philosopher of the moment for us, right? Okay. But um. Mm. So have you heard of Hegel's master slave dialectic? Okay, so um, earlier in the phenomena of spirit, Hegel is, is, is tracking what it means to be conscious. Okay, excuse me. And, but none of these forms of consciousness he considers at that point in the development are self-consciousness. Okay. And um, for Hegel, self-consciousness first arises when someone says, um, I stake a claim, right? Uh, to this being true and you would have to kill me in order to get me to back down off that. Hmm. Okay. Cause now you're aware of your position. You're aware of your belief. You're aware of what, what you think, right? You've held it out in front of you. Right. Um, and this, and then, so what, what it, and, and, and for Hegel, it's, I would die over this and I will fight you for the sake of it. Right. So that's where the, the, the this, like violent dialectic comes up between two consciousnesses, right? And he thinks it's because of that tension between two consciousnesses where we both make a claim to something, right? Uh, is where we first become self-aware. Mm. Okay. Um, and now he thinks eventually what happens is, is something, somebody has to win this, right? And what winning would count for is I force you to believe what I believe, right? Uh, and that becomes the master versus the slave, okay? And he doesn't think it's sustainable because, you know, now you know this person is agreeing with you only because of force, right? And so what human history is for Hegel is our overcoming the mass, the, 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 the violent part of the dialectic so that the dialectic can actually become a dialogue and not a violent thing, okay? But it begins for Hegel where you, you kind of like, you stick your flag in the ground and say, no, I'm right, right? And that's when real human consciousness came, on, came online. Hmm. Is that human consciousness, is that for individual humans? Is he, sorry, so is he referring yeah. to individual humans when they're like, okay, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sticking yeah. my ground here? I think for, for, for Hegel, what, where it comes out is he says what spirit really is, like what fully developed human consciousness is, is the I that is we and the we that is I, okay? So it starts out in this violent fight between two people who disagree, right? Um, and it resolves itself eventually in spirit as two people who are understanding that they can only make sense of themselves in as much as they're making sense of each other, right? In a kind of community. Mm. Mm. Yeah. You can see like, like, like I, what, like what is identity politics, right? Identity politics is, is the master slave dialectic. It's like, I have to define my position in, in opposition to something else, right? I got to make a claim. This is it. This is me, right? Okay. Yeah. Thus I need, and I need an enemy. I need, I need a slave. I can dominate to define myself against that. Right. Um, yeah. Okay. I, hey, we'll say, yeah, that's, that's, that tribal thing is where it starts. And it, we've always got that gear, but what the human drama is, is constantly trying to overcome that gear hmm. to realize that we can only really make sense in as much as we're having not a battle, but a dialogue. Hmm. Yeah. So Hegel would look at like contemporary Western society and said, you guys have like slipped back into the master slave dialectic, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, don't have the consciousness of the Prussian Republic anymore. Right, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, of course, like, I mean, uh, his way of working it out, we could, like, poke a lot of holes. Oh, of course, yeah, but I, I think he is right in that regard. Yeah. Um, but at the very least, he gives us an interpretation that would help us make sense of what's going on. Yeah. 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 I'm just curious, like, um, just in some of the things that you've mentioned about uh, 
you know the importance of of death and being willing to die for something yeah. um like just as, like as a catholic you know i i'm reading a lot of medieval sources on like monasticism and stuff yeah. Yeah. and like the the idea of, of like uh martyrdom and like a martyrdom in the in the inner life is yeah. like very key yeah. um for you know becoming christ like becoming a saint becoming holy yeah. um and i just i just wonder what what sort of a a role I, I don't know if you've ever thought of like what sort of a role that has in history and like you know uh, how does you know how does that affect you personally i guess yeah okay so um there are really only two now there's three scripture verses mm-hmm. that are like my background mantra right okay uh isaiah you know why do you spend your wages on what is not bread mm-hmm. yeah right uh from gospel each day is has evil sufficient unto itself okay and the last one is um i must decrease that he might increase mm-hmm. right Baptist, right okay i think that's that's a sort of like call to practical martyrdom right mm. okay you know what i mean yeah and, um i find myself uh very often, you know, and I'm not saying I'm like, I, I experienced my marriage in my, my fatherhood as a, as like a, like a burdensome martyr, martyrdom. Right. Mm-hmm. But that, that notion of, I need to get out of the way and let them occupy the space. Right. Yeah. They constantly contract. Right. And they need to expand. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, that is one of the most operative metaphors in my life. Mm-hmm. Okay. And and I'm and now I'm struggling. Okay, to to do that now for my students and my colleagues, and you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. To start to see. You no, know, it's it. Jim needs to contract so that others can expand. Because mm. mm. that other is ultimately, as we talked about earlier, I, I is is a revelation of Christ. Is a revelation of God. Is the space yeah. He shows up for me. Right. So what do I need to do? I need to contract so He can show up there. Mm-hmm. When you, Amos, so in, in, in some of the sources you're reading about martyrdom, is it martyrdom, can you, is it martyrdom in so, in, in so far as you're dying to your, um, your uh, primal desires and, and your selfishness? Like, how is the martyrdom? This, the, the oh, thing? yeah. I mean, like, in, there's, like, there's actual martyr narratives, like, you know, um, Ignatius on his way to be martyred in Rome, talks yeah. it, like, you know, tells the churches that he's going to meet on his way uh you know he's going to die and he says do not prevent me from coming into life do not prevent me from being born do not prevent me from being martyred is yeah. what he's telling them uh you like Socrates and Phaedo. yeah 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 but there's this sort of like a paradox the paradoxical just idea of, of death there um uh, if anyone who would gain his life has to lose it mm-hmm. yeah exactly Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. yeah. It, it's an, it's a, it's a, it, accepting my contraction, accepting my finitude. That is eternal life. Right. Mm. Is yeah. uh, so before I ask this question, Jim, I know you want to get trick or treating. So no, no, I, I've got plenty of time. Okay. It's not even dark yet, man. It's not fun to <laughs> Uh. So mm-hmm. this is the this is the thing that I I'd be curious to know. Um, you know, as a Catholic. Yeah. You know, and as someone who also thinks, you know, an atheist can live a, f- a very meaningful, fulfilled life. Yeah. yeah. You yeah. know, is there, is there significance in believing in the afterlife? Does it play any role? Yeah. So, I mean, increasingly for me, okay, in my, not necessarily in the metaphysics, right? Okay, but just in, in, in how, I orient myself in the world, right? That becomes less and less important to me, right? Like, will I, as an individual, continue on for an, for you know uh, an infinite time after my bodily demise, right? Okay. Um, and increasingly, what what is important to me is that. Um, I'm living an eternal life that, that I'm seeing my life, things in my life, revelations in my life um, that are manifestations of eternity. Okay. That I'm in contact with the immutable and the unchangeable, right. 
in how I'm living, right? Uh, C.S. Lewis has all these things about, you know, like how he, you know, he kind of feels like, like heaven spills into the ordinary world occasionally, right? Yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm kind of fascinated by the notion if, if there's eternal life, it's going on now, right? <laughs> It's eternal, right? Okay, you know, it's timeless, okay? And increasingly for me, what eternal life means, and I'm not denying anything about like, you know, literal afterlife, but in, increasingly for me, what's most important is to live the eternal life now, right? Mm. To find it and, 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 and let it show itself to me in the people and the things I'm doing. Does, does that make sense, yeah. right? Um, there's that the incredible line in uh, Terrence Malick's Thin Red Line where... Thin uh, Red Line. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah we, man, sometimes we just do one on Malick, right? Okay, right, okay. Uh, where Private Wit, you know, says he, he found the immortality that he was concerned with, right? Um, in the calm stillness, right? Of his ability to accept the moment, right? And the people... Uh, that he's with right in, in the shining through of divinity into the moment right uh, and that's not a denial of any of the metaphysical doctrines but but when you ask like what's important to how i live right now that's the sense of immortality that's most important to me right now mm. it's kind of interesting you're saying how if if eternal life is there it's happening right now because it's eternal yeah, yeah. <laughs> have you thought about that amos yeah um yeah 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 I think, When's the resurrection happen, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, I, th I think there's a lot of like Greek church fathers who would be very open to that sort of yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, so. You know, it's like, I mean, if you want like spooky new age stuff, just just read the fathers and like really, yeah. Read, it's like, yeah, like, like all, yeah. oh no, we, we can out spooky these people anytime we want, right? <laughs> yeah, which is, I think, wonderful, right? Yeah. Yeah. You know, going back to the, like, um, I might have mentioned, if I mentioned this last time in the last podcast, IJ, just shut me up, right? But um, in that, like, I must decrease the net, they, they must increase thing. Yeah. Okay. Uh, as you know, like, I've been a you know, very competitive athlete and stuff like that, right? And um, last spring, my, my two oldest sons went to state for wrestling here in Kansas. It was like a big accomplishment, right? And... Um, it was interesting since that experience, I've had really very little interest in actually competing in jujitsu, right? Mm -hmm. I think for me, what it has to do with now, is I think it's been revealed to me now that a lot of what I've done has been to set an example for them, mm -hmm. show them a certain way of life, right? And now that I see them like taking it up and surpassing me, right? And doing things that I didn't do and couldn't do along those same lines, it's kind of relieved me of that. It's, it's sort of like, I'm not the point of the spear now, they are. Yeah. Silverback can kind of sit back now, right? Mm. And, and it's what's interesting, and this kind of goes back to things we've talked about, about like what's really near and things like that. Getting over that need to compete and all this, like in, in, in a way, and which I think really was about me setting an example to my, my kids, especially my sons, right? Um, it's liberated me and I, and I see it even not just in sport, but also in like publication and stuff like that. Okay. I'm just less interested in like the competitive, you know, dick wave and all that. Right. Like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> oh man. The dick <laughs> waving. Yeah, That's like, academia. <laughs> yeah. It's not without it. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, and now it just becomes a matter of mastery. Right. Mm. Like I'm not worried. Yeah how it compares right i'm not worried because the boy like 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 what, what does the song say you know when i'm in my because i have a i have a quiver full of arrows right yeah so i need not fear when i dispute with my enemies at the city gates right because the boys will take care of it now right like the torch is passed right mm. so now what i want to do i just want to get like really good at jujitsu and really good at reading hegel and really good at teaching and i don't care if anybody hears it mm. that's it. fascinating it's it's the boys now they're the point of the spear mm. and it's, that, it's, it's since my sons have come of age that's really brought that out and it's it's a relief like, to, like some people say what's it like to get your butt kicked by your son in jiu-jitsu like it's the greatest thing that could ever happen to you yeah <laughs> right? you know, 
that. Because you know you, they can handle themselves. They can handle themselves and you don't have to handle them anymore. Mm. And, and they're greater than you and, and you're off the hook, right? At the city gates, who's going to handle stuff? Not you. Yeah. Because they have surpassed you. Right? Mm. And I have found a liberation and a liberation to go to a quiet kind of mastery, right? Rather than a competitiveness. Yeah. Right. Mm. And now you guys are young, right? So you got to get out there in an arena and like kick ass. Okay. But <laughs> right? yeah. no, you do, you have yeah, to. Yeah. 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 Thumos is real. Thumo, I'm the last guy to say Thumos isn't real. Right. Mm. Um, but someday it'll come whether, whether you're blessed with children or not, you'll, you'll get to a point where you're like, okay, done that. And it's not about the comparison anymore. And I can just kind of retire to quiet mastery. Hmm. That's kind of, that's very interesting. It's a, uh... Craig Carter, who is a professor of both Amos and I, he he once told us that for him, when he was when he had kids and he has kids, um, he was saying that it's when you have kids, what you're doing is you're dying and you're giving yourself away to your kids. Yeah. So that by the end of it, you no longer have any of yourself or any oh, of. That's, you. that's a wise man. That is a wise man. Yeah. And that's, that's what it reminds me of when you're explaining it. That's what that, that's what yeah. comes to my mind. Exactly. That's how I think of it. Yeah. Mm. And it's, but it's not, it's not, it's not a, it's a death as a liberation. And I think it's a death that opens you to the eternity, right? To like, just to quiet, still acceptance of place and pride in, in someone else. Right. Um, and like I said, I'm, I'm, I find myself kind of liberated now to a quiet mastery. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Does that, does the sense of like, you know, you, you're no longer too interested in competing, uh, let's say jujitsu, uh, that 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 liberation that you feel is it a when you say liberation are you talking like there's a sense of peace you're like i'm at peace with this yeah 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 and peace insofar as also in your if you were to die you're at peace that you know your kids could take care of themselves yeah i i honestly can say now who knows right okay there's a a song is I'll date myself by the mighty, mighty boss tones, right? Uh, a nineties ska group, right? Yep. Uh, I'm not a coward, but I've never been tested. <laughs> okay. Right. But uh, I like to think if I were, I would pass, right? That's the lyric. Okay. I, I, this is a very profound lyric, right? Yeah. But I'd like to say, I think I can honestly say, but who knows I could be wrong. You could tell me that I will be dead in the next 10 years. And I don't think I would care. Mm. Not, not because I'm some nihilist, just the opposite, right? Um, but in a lot of ways, I think my most important work is done. Right. right? Okay. Like the like uh, the 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 kids. I mean, my youngest is nine, but I mean, he's got Will, my oldest, to set the example now. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, you know what I mean. Um, so I'm I'm at this point. You know, I want to finish raising my babies, and I want to and I want to love Jen as long as God allots that to me. Right. Yeah. In a lot of ways, I feel like the fundamental work of my life is done. Right. And mm. now I can enjoy however long I have to, to master the things I want to master by God's yeah. will, Right. But you see what I mean? Like, now, like 10 years ago, if you told me you're going to die next 10 months, I was like, Oh my God, the babies, man, the babies need me. Okay. Mm. Right. Jen needs me. Um, but now I think I've come to a point in my life where I think, no, you're not. You're going to die, die in the next 10 minutes. I mean, I actually honestly think I could say right now, like, okay, all right, <laughs> you know, okay. thank you for the 47 years, right? Yeah. It's worked out, it's worked out really well. Mm -hmm. We started off the podcast, I guess, just yeah. talking about the importance of having a uh, purpose um, yeah. in order to have like a, like a world. Yeah. Um, but once you've achieved, <clears throat> excuse me, once you've achieved the most important things in your, yeah. in your life, is that sort of like, do you grow more into your world or? So, yeah, you enjoy it. Okay. You enjoy it. So now, you know, I mean, in the, I, I mean, I'm a relatively young man, right? Okay. But yeah. But really what, what it I, like, I'm, I'm planning like a 40 year victory lap now, man. Right. Okay. <laughs> like, yeah. Like, I'm, planning, yeah. Like, I'm planning to enjoy my children to see them grow into adulthood and parenthood and, and, and into career and all that stuff. Right. You know what I mean? And I'm, I'm planning to, to enjoy, you know, my, my, my friends on campus and my students and, and 
you guys, right? Okay, you know, you know what I mean, right? You're near to me. I feel you guys are near to me. I really do. And you know, and you know what I mean. And it, but it it doesn't have to, it doesn't have to go beyond this, right? right. I don't really need to push it beyond this. This is good, right? Hmm. And it, it, you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. For me, I've reached kind of like where where it's it's not progress now. It's gratitude. And there's a time for progress, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, there's a time for development, but now for me, it's gratitude, right? And the, and that constant, like, and, and, you know, quiet mastery of, yeah. of, of what I can do. Yeah. Yeah. That's and so I don't think meaning and purpose have to be going beyond where you yeah. are now, right? Okay. Accepting that and enjoying it, reveling in it, right? Contemplation for Aristotle is not going anywhere, right? Mm -hmm. There, right? So I feel like as my as my fiftieth year approaches me, I, I'm entering into contemplation. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Man, this is a powerful. I'm sorry, but here no, we are. No, this is a powerful stuff, and um... we're philosophizing, man. Yeah, <laughs> we're doing it. <laughs> um, like um, when it comes to uh, the progress and the self mastery that you're talking about. Yeah. You know, uh, is it ever too late for someone? To, 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 to turn around and say, hey, I got to do, I got to master myself. You know, I'm 65 years old, let's say. I don't I'm think so. Out a number. I don't think so. Because it's not like, um, yeah, can, I'll just use like a jiu-jitsu as an example, but it's more than jiu-jitsu, right? Okay, so I have a friend I train with who's, I think he's 56, right? He's a white belt. And he's had, it's all, he's, he's had soldier, shoulder surgeries and all this stuff, right? And he, I think he's feeling now he's not going to get to the black belt, right? And I'm like, well, so what? <laughs> so what, right? It's not, it's not like, it's not like at the finish line, right? The mm -hmm. point is entering into practices, right? D d you know what I mean? Um, and so, yeah, I don't think it's too late. I don't think it's too late to take something up. I don't think it's too late, right, um, to enjoy things. Does, does that make sense, mm -hmm. right? And I think maybe, let's say you've lived, like I've been so blessed. I look up, up and by the way, I turn 47 next week. So this is a great like birthday reflection. Hey. Yeah, right? Uh, I've lived like a really blessed 47 years, right? Okay. And I've made great progress in things. And, you know, I've like, yeah, right. Okay. I, I, I don't mean to be arrogant, right? But I've been really blessed. And I've been able to do things, right? There might be people, you know, who are 47 and have lived largely wasted lives to this point, right? Did mm -hmm. you, right? Okay. We know that. Sure. Yeah. I'm not saying that about my friend. My, my friend I was talking was like a very accomplished physician. Okay. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Of course. Um. But most that, but that, that's not just like, but that's, that's the case with most people. Most yeah. people live Basically. life without a purpose. Without a purpose. And I'm not, I, but I, I think I, I, and maybe this is just like a commitment to a kind of radical hope, right? Mm -hmm. I don't think it's ever too late for someone to take up a purpose, right? Mm -hmm. it, it, you know what I mean? Yeah. If there's humility there to learn. And, and if you can free yourself from resentment. So I think that's a very big thing. It's to be able to free yourself from resentments, right? Um, does that make sense right because i think largely finding purpose is decreasing that others can increase or something else can increase yeah so i don't think it, i don't think it's too late i think you could live a terrible hard 47 years and find something that gives you meaning yeah is so okay so for let's say for someone who you know who and this is this is you know and jim if uh, this question is more like a, uh, you know, if if there's someone, let's say, who's, you know, it doesn't matter what age they are, they're thinking, hey, you know, as as a non, as a as a believer in in God, and 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 another person who's not a believer in God, and they're thinking, hey, look, what is the purpose? I don't know what the purpose is. Like, what is the point of living? So, uh, and let's say, <laughs> let's say, let's say that they're feeling the way. Leo Tol Tolstoy felt when he's writing yeah. confession. He's like, I've achieved yeah. all these things, but I feel like absolute garbage. I feel like I've done nothing. At the, like someone like that, that like, what would you say to them? You know, if you had a friend and said, Hey Jim, this is where I'm at. What do I do? How do, where do I begin? Yeah. I can only show it to him mm. by making myself available to him to make my friendship a possible meaning for him, a possible purpose right like i i can i can only save someone from nihilism right 
That's good. That's what you're talking about there, right? Yeah. By my solicitude for him. They say, you, you think you live in a world that doesn't care about you, yeah. right? You think you live in a world that's meaningless. Well, God damn it. I love you and I'm here and I'm talking to you. So you're wrong. You're wrong. I'm proving it to you by my solicitude for you right now. Mm. And that's all you can do. Right. And, and man, I, and there, man, I have some friends, people, people I know, right. Who, man, they carry some heavy, heavy burdens that I am blessed to not even have anything close to that in my life. Right. Mm. What can I do for them? I show up. Right. I don't let them have a narrative that nobody cares about them and the world is meaningless. I won't let them have it. And the only way I can do that is to show up, to be there in their face, loving them. Right. Like, that's it. Yeah. Right. That's, that's the part. Amos, do you have, um, before we, before we, before we finish this up, Amos, do you have some last questions that you got? Um, I had one a moment ago, but it's gone out of my head. Yeah. I saw Sorry, you. I on too long now. Yeah. I, I saw you go. <laughs> yeah um okay well jim of, of course you're not on social media but you are you have you do have that twitter that you don't do anything with yeah, yeah. Um, yeah i mean hit it on there i mean if people want to talk to me i'll talk to them on there right <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not opposed to talking to people right okay. i'm just not going to be following celebrities right yeah so do yeah. you have you know before we close this up and, do you and, have and find me on facebook people can you know message me on facebook that's fine right james and, under james d madden i don't know why james i didn't. D. Madden. Uh, and do you have any like uh, talks coming up that people can? I know you can find Jim. Uh, you can find Jim's work on the Thomistic Institute podcast. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, um, I'm trying to, I think there's a new one. I mean, there's those three from the summer that that you listen to. Actually, I'll say this: those are three of the ones I'm most proud of. Actually, right? Yeah, yeah. They were good. They're really good. They're okay. very good. Um, you notice I'm starting to just like read papers too. It's all I have all this like. I have hundreds of pages of unpublished stuff. I got to figure out what I'm going to do with now. Mm. But I did one at, at Florida State on philosophy of mind stuff. That sh- or it was, it was a Zoom. It should be going up soon on SoundCloud. Um, was that I, with the Thomistic Institute? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, and then I'm hoping to get to a couple universities next semester. So there should be some stuff coming. Um, okay. But yeah, if people want to talk to me, I'm happy to talk to them. I and mean, they can give me on Facebook or they can hit the bean reel uh, on Twitter, right? Um, yeah, I'm, it's just, like I said, I'm not, I'm just not going to like define myself by social media. I don't want to become a social media figure. Right. You yeah. Know, I don't want to like get into where I'm, that becomes my nearest world. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And there's a, if they find me at, at Benedictine college, my email address is up there too. And they can send me emails. That's awesome. Jim. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks so much for coming on. Oh gosh. I mean, and I tell you, you know, anytime guys, I love to talk to you fellas. Uh, and, uh, so please, please, anytime I'm, I'm glad to do it. I've got, you know, I've, I've got time now in my, in my contemplative retirement now. So. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh man. Okay. Well, you know, Jim, one, one thing was, yeah, yeah. is, uh, if we did this and we, and we brought Jen on. Jen, your wife. Yeah. Okay. Let's do it. PhD psychologist, therapist, mother of six, jujitsu practitioner. A hundred percent. Yeah, right? I mean, she is the more interesting one in this marriage. For you guys to talk to, I'm gonna go right on. <laughs> much, much better looking, Fox. Right? No, I, we we'd be happy to do that. I mean, that, yeah, that, that might be fun. That might be fun. Yeah, if we could we could talk marriage stuff and all that. I mean, that's yeah, yeah, that would be great. Um, cool. um, and obviously Jim's book. Do you have a new book? Okay, Jim, this is something we do. so we'll have to have you back on because I know that you have a book that you're working on, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, you know, we'll have your wife on, but we'll also have you because I, I, I actually forgot that you, you're writing a book. Yeah. Um, when's that book? Is there a deadline for that book? No, no, uh, there's not. Although those, those, those three lectures um, that you listened to, Amos, mm-hmm. I think you listened to those Latin, those recent, one, recent ones on the Thomistic in, uh, Institute, those are material from, from that book, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. They're like kind of simplifications of it. And um, there's another lecture. The one that's going to be coming up now is that's material from that book too. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And I'm happy to send you guys like uh, chapters if you want, but yeah, sure. there are better ways to spend your time too. No, I, I read the chapter you sent me. Did you really? Cool. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um, but well, Jim, thanks again. 
Appreciate yeah. it. Yeah.